This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 1804. It was comic talk all along. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak. I'm Ian Levinstein. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Adam Murdo. And I'm Chris Eberly, motoring right back to my childhood. <laughs> childhood never ends, my friend. Childhood never ends. No, it doesn't. <laughs> if you're yeah, listening well. and not watching, I was bringing across the stream my groovy 1970s die-cast metal Captain America Hot Wheels van. <laughs> Mellow set of wheels. Yeah, oh, Murd, perfect. And when you look to the back, there's a viewfinder, and you see nice. like, it's a, it looks like a Frank Springer rendition of Captain America <laughs> flinging a shield at you. Nice. Frank nice. Springer. <laughs> Shane, that was for you, buddy. Oh, boy. Well, here, I, I think a couple acquisitions since uh, last time. Ooh. Oh. Zartan? Zartan. <laughs> Not just Zartan. Zartan. All right, perfect. <laughs> and look at the midriff. Look at this oh, hood. It's oh, a wow. Hood. It is finally designated a hood. That is a badass Zartan, you I must mean say. It, it wasn't his hair? Wow. <laughs> I don't think it was ever intended to be his hair, but in the cartoon, it sure looked like his hair. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, that's, that's, that's news to me, uh, sir. Ooh. And then this is the new Cobra Trooper that was just released. Wow. Very nice. It's a little different than the, the Target eBay exclusive. Yeah, because, different regiments could have variations of uniforms. Yeah. <laughs> Comes with a little bit less accessories, yeah. different color scheme, but it still looks good. Where'd you get uh, where, the, where, the one I'm getting for you is yet to arrive, Shane, but I'm keeping an eye out. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, end of the month, next yeah. month, something like that. Where'd you get the others, uh, Shane, uh, from uh, Target? Uh, no, so <laughs> I have... I have them on pre-order, one each because that's all you were allowed through Hasbro's Pulse site. Okay. And then somebody said that GameStop, of all places, had them <laughs> for pre-order again, ah. and they were shipping. Okay. So I went and looked on GameStop's site, and they had Zartan, and I clicked to get a Zartan, and Cobra Trooper was gone. And that's fine. And then it took a couple of weeks until it came because it really went to back order as soon as I ordered it. Um but still, my other pre-order is still out there somewhere in the world waiting to be shipped from Hasbro. The Cobra Trooper I got from Entertainment Earth. I got a couple of them, um, and they came last week. So that's really early compared to some of the other ones. Nice. Shane, I was interested in, in your, in your, your uh, toy fairing adventures. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I watch I – watch, because I hardly go anywhere right now. Um, most – Two reasons. One, because of the pandemic. Two, because all the shelves are bare yet. But I do watch videos of people toy hunting, mm -hmm. and they find stuff, but there's whole gaps of weeks where they find nothing, and the shelves are bare. So I'm not going to waste my time going out looking for anything. I, I don't look for much except G.I. Joe right now. I can imagine you watching videos of people, you know, as, as, you've, as you've said before, uh, you know, going to Toys R Us Canada and you just shaking your fist at oh them, my God. being like, how could you? <laughs> yeah. Well, well okay, so... With this Joe line, that that Target Cobra Trooper and Beachhead, and this version of Roadblock, and the Baroness with her coil cycle, whatever that is, they were all Target exclusives down here. Mm -hmm. um, they're all over the place in Canada right now. Of course. <laughs> and Hasbro has the Viper and Firefly, which were again Target exclusives. They're available on Hasbro Pulse's UK site for pre-order. Uh, now, the Viper one sold out like that. Right. There were only a few of them online. Yeah. But just the fact that they're able to do that, I know. I'm, gl I'm glad that UK people can get a chance because it's it's at least right there. You, if you could get it, you could order it. But, man, the, the Target exclusives are insanely frustrating but that's also you know that's the same as like you know rights deals that we have with television even oh yeah because like think yeah. about the fact that uh titans airs on netflix uh yep. overseas uh you know it's hbo max now but you know it was dc universe before then but yep. literally anybody with, with, with a with a netflix uh, subscription elsewhere could watch it there same with discovery 
Mm, yep, that's uh, Amazon Prime, I think, uh, yep. elsewhere. Yeah. So, oh no, I'm sorry. Picard is Amazon Prime. Discovery is Netflix. Oh God, I didn't know it was even broken up that much. Yeah, Ooh. I know. It's 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 ridiculous wow. overseas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, before we get uh, too far into the episode, uh, as usual, we'll go ahead and thank you, the listeners, uh, for the contributions that you have been making to the Patreon. And uh, that is over at patreon.com slash comicgeekspeak with our wonderful CGS Man logo at the top there. And uh, we're uh, at 96 patrons at $283 per month. Oh, thank you so much. Indeed, yep. Uh, As usual, as we say, uh, every episode, you keep the lights on, you keep it running here, and you ensure that this show has a future outside of us really wanting to do it, but it takes money to do it. (laughs) And uh, you guys very much make that happen, so we thank you so much for that. And for that, Thank you. And thank you to anybody who's doing old school donations as well, because we do still get occasional PayPal donations. Um, So if if you're not the type of person who wants to do Patreon, you can still just head to the website and go to comicgeekspeak.com slash donate.php and uh, follow the PayPal instructions on there and, you know, one time donation. And that's that. So thank you so much for your support in any way, shape or form. And uh, Levy Poo, don't you have your own Patreon as well? I do, yes. Uh, that's uh, patreon.com slash comic timing. Um, and uh, speaking of comic timing, uh, anybody who uh, is a listener of the show or even is just tangentially interested, uh, we're going to be running in about two weeks our 15th anniversary episode of Comic Timing because somehow that happened. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're going to be doing the Snyder Cut uh, because uh, some of our most uh, contested and controversial episodes were us talking about Sny- Jack- Zack Snyder movies, whether it be Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, or Justice League. Now we're going to do the Justice League Snyder Cut and a uh, friend, longtime friend of the show and some semi-regular Jamal Igo will be a part of that, along with hopefully Raf Suhu, Donovan, Brent, uh, and uh, Chris and Brandon, so uh, it'll be a full house, and we're going to run that on the comic timing feed, and probably even the com- sorry, and, and the comic geek speak feed as well, and probably even the comic geek speak U- YouTube, since I am going to zoom it. So we'll go for uh, it. Stay tuned for the in- further information. And when is on that, that premiere on HBO Max? Uh, that premieres next week. next week, actually, the same day as uh, as as Cap- uh, Winter Soldier and Falcon, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's uh, the nineteenth, I think. It right? is. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, we, and we were saying pre-show that. Some of our listeners may very well have watched it already, yeah. Because there was a <laughs> they gl- thought they were watching Tom and Jerry, exactly. Yeah, or or they found out and then immediately were like, "Crap, I got to go watch Tom and Jerry." Uh, and uh, and There's no shame it. in watching Tom and Jerry. Oh yeah, I exactly. love Tom and Jerry. Uh, that, uh, funny enough, that's that's why we recorded a half hour later than usual tonight because uh, uh, Martha was watching Tom and Jerry with some of her school kids. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, they went to load Tom and Jerry, and rather than Tom and Jerry, the Snyder Cut loaded. Uh, so uh, a bunch of people out there got to watch it two weeks early, and they've been pretty mum on it. I really haven't seen any spoilers running about, so good one, on that. One, just one preliminary question I have. Is this supposed to be that drastically different from what was released in theaters? Let, That's what they say. Well, let's, put okay. it, let's put it this way, Chris. The original cut of the movie is about two hours. This one's okay. four Oh geez, that, yeah. that could be a, that could be a really bad thing. Depending, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Snyder's yeah, lack of cuts. And, and exactly. w- wasn't there wasn't there a, a Justice League extended one that was almost three? No, they they never or did an ex- they never did an extended of Justice League. They did one of Batman v Superman. Batman Superman, okay. Yeah, um, I couldn't remember that one. I and, and I actually prefer the extended cut to I the too. Uh, to the original with that one, but this one I do too. It, it all the future scenes that you thought would have happened are included in this. Uh, like you know, slight spoilers for people who haven't seen the trailers. Uh, apparently, Jared Leto's Joker is going to be in there somewhere. Oh. Um, there's going to be probably. Uh, I think they filmed new end scenes as well, so there might be a little bit more uh, jo- of uh, Joe Manganiello's uh, Deathstroke in there, along with uh, Lex Luthor, um, and. Pretty much is just like every single thing that Zack Snyder wanted to do is going to be in this. All right. And, and we'll see what happened. <laughs> Stay tuned for our reaction. Yes, I still don't like the way Darkseid and uh, Steppenwolf look. Yeah, Steppenwolf looks a little bit better now, but uh, he still kind of looks like a pincushion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, is Darkseid supposed to be in this fu- this new co? Oh, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, there's an actual big bad. Uh, cause, okay. I mean – from everything I've heard, they're leading to a sequel that will never happen. Um, okay. 
Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and and because, you know, everything that they've said uh, over at uh, D.C. is that, you know, we're done with this, um, but we're letting this happen because, A, we need material for HBO Max, and B, there was enough demand. Um, so that's that's going to happen. So we'll see. And uh, also, uh, before we forget to mention it, before we get started here, uh, Murd, a reminder about the best of 2020. Oh, yes, certainly, Ian. Uh, yes, the voting, the final voting for the recipients of the CGS Best of 2020 Awards uh, is still in progress. Um, uh, by the time you hear this, you'll have a little over a week to get those ballots in. Um, yes, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the voting will end uh, Sunday, March 21st, 2021 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so just uh, seek out uh, the list of nominees. You can find it on our uh, Facebook uh, supergroup page or at uh, the comic forums dot vanilla community dot com. Um, we, we ask that you vote for us uh, one and only one nominee in 12 out of the 16 categories. Now, we apologize. We know not everybody has read everything. You might not uh, be familiar with everything in every category, but uh, please do us that favor and vote for 12. Vote in 12 of the 16 categories. Send your ballot into comic geek speak. At, oh, sorry. To best of, beg your pardon, to best of at uh, comicgeekspeak.com uh, by the, the, the time and date stipulated. And uh, we'll tabulate your votes and uh, we will be announcing um, the final winners of the, the uh, best of 2020 awards in an upcoming episode of this very podcast. Yes, indeed. Meanwhile, comics. Yes. Yes. Been a while since we've had a comic talk and uh, there is both media and comic books to talk about for sure. Um, how about we start off uh, with the spoilers and get that out of the way? Um, Sounds good. And uh, let's discuss some WandaVision. Because Cut. my oh my. <laughs> <laughs> and yet again, no earmuffs for Murd. That makes mm, me very that's happy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> On the same page as the rest of you, gentlemen, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> excellent. 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 Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk uh, the rest of the series here. So if you have not watched until the uh, until episode nine of WandaVision, now will be the time for your earmuffs. And uh, I'll go ahead and put uh, some markers in the YouTube version uh, for anybody who wants to skip ahead. But uh, yeah, uh, thoughts on uh, on the series as a whole. I guess, uh, Chris, might as well start off with you. Oh, honored. Um I loved it. I think, I, first of all, although I have some mixed feelings about the last episode, I love the overall series immensely. Yeah. Um, high marks to Marvel for, for adapting one of their most complicated, edgiest characters. Oh, yeah. And taking on really one, one of the, the darker aspects of that universe in terms of one of their heroic characters. Um, because the Vision, the Scarlet Witch, if, if you, because they, they obviously borrow from various plot lines from over the years. Um, and I was really impressed on, on how how deep they went with it, um, right down to like you see that the kids are not even real. Like as they start to, to disintegrate, essentially, I was just torn about which reality to go into, and like they they really, I think they really honored the essence of that character, and, and, and the, of course her relationship with the Vision. Um, and another another testament to how good it is that my wife watched the whole thing with me. Wow. Oh, wow. Does One little caveat, and I, and I think this is very typical of a lot of people who are not comic people who watch this stuff. She loved it until the fighting at the end, then she was mm. bored. Mm. Mm. And I have to admit, I think it's, maybe it's just I'm getting older. I was bored too. Um, I, 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 I think this is more just my sensibility now as, as a viewer of these things. Yeah. I find the fights the least interesting part of any of this stuff at this point. Well, um, and, and some of that also for me is. I don't quite how cool her costume looked, but anyway, go ahead. I don't disagree with that, but we've also gone from what we wanted, starting with Christopher Reeve's Superman, all the way to Avengers Endgame. I yeah. mean, it's it's hard to top that kind of a fight scene Fair point. in Endgame. Fair point. So some things come across. Oh, okay. Yep, they're fighting. Yay. Yeah. So again, that's that's a very. It's not even really a quibble. It's just something more about me yeah. as, as a viewer than and a reader than anything else. But yeah. I, I I think I think she should be nominated for an Emmy. Oh sure. I, I thought her performance was tremendous. Um, they were both tremendous, but she she really had a carry. I mean, you know, she did the research. You know, the people who wrote this show did mm -hmm. the research. Yeah. And, and like the accent going in and out, and and, and you know that when they took when Agatha Harkness took her through. Uh, you know, her memories and 
that the scene where she's in the Avengers compound was so well acted. Yeah. When they're, they're sitting on the bed watching the TV and he's trying to make, you know, that human connection they're struggling with. And, and, and she's, you can tell how much she, she's, you know, moved by what he's trying to do. Like they, they have such tremendous chemistry, those two actors, and they so clearly understand the characters that they're playing um, that I can't wait to see what else they do with it. Uh, the only other few bit of concert I made, I, I loved the modern version of her costume at the end. I thought that, that I thought it looked yeah. good. Yeah. And it really sprang from the comics, essentially. That was really well done. Um, and uh, yeah, the only, the only thing that kind of struck me as odd was, and you know, it's, it, it's kind of in keeping with the world of the books, too. She just kind of goes away after like destroying the lives of a large number of people in this mm. town. Yeah. And Monica Rambeau is like, they'll never know what they did for you. And I'm thinking, well, she did take away all their identities for a lengthy period of time. <laughs> so I don't know how grateful they should feel about anything else at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, to psychological and physical torture. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see if, if, if how they carry that forward. I, I, now, here's what I want to see I want to see a trip to Wonder Gore Mountain. Because they've tied her into the dark hold part of her history, which you know Murd and, and I are both very familiar with, and I'd love to see them pursue that further. Because the other thing is, I want to what you, what you guys thought. I was half expecting to go into the mutant terrain, but they didn't. Yeah, so, I, I'm I'm very glad they didn't uh, because it would have been giving too many fans exactly what they wanted, um, yeah. and and I think the the tease in this is one of the things that made me love it as much as I did. You know, like like you thought it was going to go one way just because you just just because we're nerds. But if you would if right. you would, if you had gone too much into that lore, then you would have lost the plebes, you know, or the you know the the non-comic book people even further. And that would have been its own problem, which is a large number of the people watching the the, the show. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially um, when you're on something like Disney Plus, you know, which has yeah. you know tons of you know non comic book people on it. Like you got you got to keep things grounded. But but yeah. emphasizing the like the witchcraft side of her her story, so to speak, by going into the dark hold and yeah. all of that. That they could do a lot of interesting things with that. Hell, I want to see the high evolutionary. Damn it! Like there's a <laughs> lot they could do. I want to see like anthropomorphic ape people. Oh like, my god! You know, mute, all, like the, the the Knights of Wonder Girl. Like, there's a lot they could do with this. Definitely. So I, I overall, I loved it, and and I, again, I just applaud them for starting off with such a challenging part of the Marvel universe. Yep, no question about it. Uh, Murd. Uh, well, I I found it extremely enjoyable too. Um, I was able to predict. Uh, precisely none of the plot developments, <laughs> uh, which uh, makes me as <laughs> as much impressed uh, with the, uh, the the creative team behind the series as I am disappointed in myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go easy on yourself, Mert. Yes, 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 yes. But uh, yeah, I'm, I was. Uh, there were a lot of uh, really <laughs> exciting moments. I mean, the, the arrival of uh, Evan Peters on the scene was something I don't think anybody saw coming. Uh, which led to such uh, rampant fan theorizing, and uh, I confess to being a little bit disappointed, Ian, that they didn't uh, lean into that a little bit further than they did. Yeah, they they pulled a real boner. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wah, wah. Yeah, I I thought maybe this would be, you know, as Chris said, I thought maybe this would be a good way to a good backdoor by which to admit all the mutant lore yeah. into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like I was thinking at one point, even maybe this, we'd find out that uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe as we've known it so far has just been a, a House of M type scenario that Wanda created. <laughs> and that it was always supposed to involve you know, Reed Richards and company and mutants and so mm. on and so forth. But yeah. you're probably right, Ian, that that's a lot to throw at a largely lay person audience all at once. Right. And, and at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean we've seen the last of Evan Peters, nor no. the character no i just i do wish that they would have kept him as another so, universe's yeah. pietro yeah as opposed to ralph boner of, yeah uh, <laughs> that, of earth 616 yeah but that's what, one of the bigger disappointments i had but uh, but <laughs> i love that in the end all of agnes's references to her husband ralph mm -hmm. were all him you know that that was my favorite. That's true, right? That, that was my that, that was my okay. favorite yeah. part. You know his yeah, good point. The, the off screen husband that we never see was always him. 
So that's <laughs> that's that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Something Matt pointed out on the CGS forums, uh, Senor Scratchy, the rabbit, is kind of a, an oblique reference to uh, her son from the comics, Nicholas Scratch. Ah. Oh, oh. I didn't even catch that. There we go. <laughs> wow. But yeah, just uh, Catherine Hahn as uh, Agnes slash Agatha in general. Uh, yeah, showing that she's, you know, th- th- there's more to her than the comedy. You know, she's, she's got some range as an yeah. actress herself. Yeah. And I, I, I love the way that she was insinuated into the story. Exactly. It was her all along, and how crazy is it that a little Munsters theme song parody about how she was the bad guy all along winds up topping the iTunes charts? Oh, cool. Yeah, even even better, Murd. There's there's a video on YouTube of the like 14 different languages that they had to sing that song in because there's that <laughs> many different audio tracks of this available on Disney Plus. Jeez. And it's amazing how well it works in pretty much every single language. <laughs> Is it the same group of singers every time? No, it's a different one uh, for for each uh, for each ah. language. But uh, but still, they get the feel of the song down at mm. least. Yeah. How do we? What do we think about how they used Agatha Harkness in, in the show? Well, in, especially as as the sort of the villain of the piece. There mm. was not disappointed. Uh, she was uh, at least a somewhat sympathetic villain. You know that that little uh, flashback to the seventeenth century uh, Salem, Massachusetts, certainly helped with that. Uh, I loved that <laughs> the look of the character, her costuming, the way that they were they found a plot connected way to retain that little cameo roach. I saw that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and and have it you know have some significance uh, to her character and her backstory in this iteration of reality. Have it make sense. Um, yeah, and then the way that she actually, you know, in, in the comics, as we all know, Agatha Harkness was not an, uh, an antagonist to Wanda, but her mentor right. in uh, the use of actual magic. And a babysitter for the Richards clan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and also I think one of the head matrons of the New Salem colony out in, Ma- yep. in Colorado, mm-hmm. if I'm remembering correctly. But yep. uh, here she's a bit less sympathetic, but uh, you know, they at least retain some of her pathos. And uh, she, she does, in a way, educate Wanda. Uh, you know, gives her a, a kind of a crash course in her own nature and the nature of the chaos magic she wields, mm-hmm. and uh, it's <laughs> and her final fate is just too perfect for words. Oh, what a torment! God. Yes, and it's also a torment out of which she can easily be unboxed if she's needed in like some portion yeah. story. Exactly, Wanda needs a little more coaching. Yep. Yeah, and, and and that that was my favorite part is is we we've, we've gotten further away from the the Marvel trope of the villain dies in the end. Um, which which was the case in so many of the early movies because they were just throwaways. Like for these, you know, villains haven't died, meaning that they can come back. You know, the fact that we're getting Zemo in in Falcon and Winter Soldier is because Zemo. is because they did not kill him in yep. in winter in you know in Winter Soldier. Uh, sorry, in Civil War, even though they yeah. could have, they they chose not to, um, and that was the smart thing to do, really. Um, so yeah, keeping these characters around for future use makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. If it was good enough for Stanley, it's good enough for these people. Exactly. So, White Vision. Yes. <laughs> yes. I yes. was going to bring that up. Yep. I was. Wow. I had a, a pretty serious fan guessing when we got uh, <laughs> Avengers West Coast John Byrne Pale Vision. Yep. That's what <laughs> yeah. I was thinking. Yep. I, I I kind of saw this coming, and and this was one of the few instances that I that I called, um, but at the same time, I didn't call how they did it. Um, I initially thought that that Wanda was going to try to bring Vision back, and in doing so, she was going to essentially wipe the version of Vision that she knew, um, and, and in turn, we get White Vision. The way they did it instead, with you know the Vision that we've been seeing all series, not even really being Vision, but the bit of the Mind Stone that Wanda had. Um, and the bit that she absorbed from Thanos, because that, in essence, was Vision, was fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah. The only thing, the only question I have, was that a dummy body they had on display for Wanda, or did they just put him together really freaking fast? I kind of wonder if it wasn't a dummy that they had. Yeah, because because for them to get to that level suddenly is just a little bit hard to hard well how to well although well, how long was she in the, in the town though not long i think only a few weeks yeah okay in that yeah. might only have been a few days yeah well, it could have been yeah yeah from everything that, that 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 they seem to imply this was not happening for very long um yeah 
Yeah. And it looked like a like a like a makeshift portable base that they had set up. It wasn't something that's mm. been permanent, which if it had been months or years, you'd think it would be more of permanent buildings than break down and move easily kind of base. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and I, in terms of the white vision, I, I love how they've, of course, now opened the door to the vision to actually return. Yeah. Right. Well, because- and I, I like how so so-called fake vision had a hand in reconditioning yep. real vision mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> yes no I, I i do have to vary with you guys i thought the fight scene between the two visions of you know the, the visual use of their oh, that was powers cool. for example no, that was cool that was fantastic it, it was yeah. amazing oh, yeah. i also appreciate that the fight ended via logic yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yep. that was so yeah. on yeah that was a great it, scene that was so within the characters because yes, because they're so yeah, logic thomas would have been proud of that scene oh absolutely. well and and just the way his face looks there in that picture he yep. at this point looks evil yeah, he does. Absolutely hideous. Yeah. And, and and you could tell, too, that, like, it wasn't necessarily because, you know, he was built that way or anything like that. It's just that. No, no. He is a, he is a machine, you know, yeah. and, and he was programmed to be this way. There is no Mind Stone giving him life at this point. However, yeah. just like any other entity, it's it all depends on your memories. And the mm. fact that, you know, Mind Stone Vision was able to you know, unlock the memories of this vision yep. means that the emotions could very well still be there and that this could very well still be our vision, as was displayed by the changing of the color of the eyes, which was Oh, like, I think they are. Yeah. I absolutely think it is. Yeah. Yep. The one thing that annoyed me, though, um, is just how quickly he just disappeared. Um, you know, the fact that he flies off and he's never seen again. Um, <laughs> I expected him to show up again at the end. Yeah, that that was that was a little bit of a of a of a cock tease there. Like like I was yeah. fully expecting more from that, and then it's just it just didn't happen. Um, which makes sense when you only have a limited amount of time. I was also half expecting that last episode to be an hour and a half. You know, because they could have. Um, yeah. You know, we got yeah. the we got the longest episode that we got, but I was I was honestly expecting longer. Mm. Now. I really loved the whole the whole show as a saga, as a movie. Yeah. I loved how it started with the throwback to old sitcom TV. Yes. With no real explanation because I do know some people that were lost on that and could have cared less, but I, because I like old sitcom TV shows. Same here. I grew up watching reruns of them, so I, mm-hmm. I, I really yep. enjoyed it. Right yep. there with you, brother. Yep. My mother my mother raised me on I Love Lucy, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I in the back of my head as the first couple episodes went along, I did in the back of my head think, Oh my god, what if they bring in X Men Pietro in? Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. And that's the closest I got to calling anything in the whole show. Same here. Mm-hmm. And it was great. I do wish they would I said it before, I do wish they would have left him as Pietro from that universe. Mm-hmm. And you're right. We may see him again in some capacity, and and that would be great too. Yeah, I think for the episode that he was Quicksilver um, at Halloween stole the show in a lot of ways. Yeah. He was he was hilarious. Oh yeah, all their costumes were great, being kind of homemade <laughs> versions of what they should have looked like from the old comics. Um, I loved how they unfolded the real big baddie. Because I had no clue who that was at first. I my my lore and Marvel is not nearly as strong as the the rest of you, especially Chris and Adam. I didn't know who Agnes was. I had to look her up because I just don't know that that kind of history for Scarlet Witch. But I loved it. Um, I liked how they went with the kids. I liked how they went with the Vision. I liked how he, as the Mind Stone Vision, kind of had his own evolution in that world, realizing somewhat what was going on maybe not coming to the conclusion till the very end, but then helping white vision come to terms with what he was and locking those memories. Like, like you all said, I absolutely love that they brought in and gave purpose to Darcy and yes, it's good to see that character again. Jimmy, Jimmy Woo. Woo. Yep. Jimmy Woo. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love that they were in there. Cause I like, I like the fact that this is one universe and they do use all these characters yet. I don't feel like it's forced in a lot of ways. Like other movies, when you see characters cross over from property to property, sometimes it just doesn't feel right. Yeah, This really feels like a natural thing to do. I like how this is the first time we get to see grown-up Monica Rambeau. Mm-hmm. All, all just fantastic parts of this show. Well, And 
Go ahead, go ahead, Ian. I was just going to say, I forget whether we mentioned this on our on the you know the first couple of episodes that we discussed, but I think it really helped that they brought on sitcom veterans uh, to mm, assist point. with That's this. Point. The, yep. fa- the fact that uh, you know both Darcy and Wu's you know actors yeah. have sitcom backgrounds, you know, fresh sure. fresh off the boat, sure. and uh, sure. and two broke girls, two I broke girls help Absolutely. with help with this a lot. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that. To piggyback on Shane's point is that, like with with the Darcy character, they show that her character because we haven't seen her since the, what the second Thor film. Yeah, Thor yeah, the Dark World. Yeah. Her character's progressed. She's now like an astrophysicist or whatever she yep. is. She has a doctorate. You know, she's obviously very capable, but she still has that that cutting sense of humor. Mm-hmm. And what I loved about Jimmy Woo is that in Ant Man he was there for comic relief. Mm-hmm. Where in this film that was still there, but they also showed how because the Jimmy Woo of the comics is a really capable mm-hmm. espionage agent. Yeah. And that you saw more of that in this in this in this series, where you know he, he's out thinking his, the the the, the uh, other government spooks. He has yeah. combat prowess in terms of hand to hand. Because uh, Jimmy Woo is, I think, one of the earliest Asian characters in comics. Mm-hmm. Dates back uh, to the fifties. Yeah, he's an Atlas character in the, uh, you know, the uh, very much a book of its time, the Yellow Claw character. Um, so Jimmy Woo predates the Marvel universe. Uh, in that sense, and they brought, they folded him to Shield and so forth. But and, yeah. and you're right; they still had some of his comedic stuff there from Ant Man and the Wasp. But I also yeah. like that they put his sleight of hand <laughs> that he got from exactly. Ant Man in there. Oh, my my, yeah. my my favorite my favorite moment with Wu was uh, was the you know uh, I'm going to have agents here in an hour, you know, and and then he has to be on the phone like, hey, could you get here in an hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now no, they were they were really well used. Yeah, I I liked how we got extra credit scenes through some of the episodes. It wasn't through every single one, but I, I liked what we got. Mm -hmm. The only thing I really thought would have happened at the end of this. And I liked the extra credit scenes we got through this. It, it, it was satisfying. I really thought they were going to not lead into winter soldier and Falcon because that would have disappointed me. Yeah. I didn't want that. That's already going to be huge on Disney Plus. I didn't need them to introduce them on this show, so I'm glad that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. I really thought they were going to bring in Doctor Strange at the end to tie into the next movie. Well, well I thought that there would be a movie cameo in that way. See, and I can understand why they didn't, but in oh, a way, that, but, but in the way they did, because she, because Scarlet Witch is going to be in Doctor Strange. Oh yeah, you know that that's yep. that's been confirmed. Uh, she's going to be at an end. Remember the original slate of movies. Um, I, I'm going to see if I can find it. Uh, this this show was initially only supposed to be happening like a month before the release of Doctor Strange, because mm-hmm. b- before the you know coronavirus came in and changed the, uh, the the slate of Marvel movies, this show was supposed to be second release, not first, and it was supposed to be. You know, essentially timed where immediately afterwards in May, we are going to get the release of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I've, I found the original chart here, so let me go ahead and bring that up. But Do they have uh, a new release date for that movie now? Yeah, next year. Next year, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, right. so that so that's how long we're going to have to wait for this now uh, due to that. But yeah, as you can see from the uh, from the list that I have here, uh, spring twenty twenty one was the initial release date for WandaVision. Uh, so we got that a little bit early. Uh, because they they finished it a little bit early and they didn't have uh, Winter Soldier done, um, and uh, Mark, May seventh, twenty twenty one, we were supposed to be getting Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness. So that's why this leads in as much as it does, yeah, and probably why they didn't film a scene with Doctor Strange because you were literally going to get Doctor Strange either way. So so Ian, looking at this handy dandy chart here, yeah. so to adjust to our new reality, so. Mm-hmm. Black Widow is the next film coming out, I assume. Correct. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Black Widow okay. comes out, and that's out the way it always was. Yeah. That was yeah. the next film. Yeah. Uh, it got delayed essentially a year. Um, because and so that's coming out this spring. That's coming yeah. out this spring in May. Okay. Um, uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier comes out a week after we record this. Right. Um, and then uh, it's nothing till Black. Uh, sorry, Loki comes out the month after that. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Okay. So all, all the TV shows didn't really get too delayed. Um, just a little bit of changing in the schedules. Uh, Hawkeye will probably come shortly after Loki because they, they're filming that right now. Yeah. But we get three movies this year. Uh, we get Doctor Strange. Uh, sorry, we don't get Doctor Strange. We get, uh, we get, if I remember correctly, Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and Eternals Ugh. all this year. 
Um, and then after that, we get Doctor Strange and uh, Thor next year, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh and Spider Man is this year. So and it's Spider Man. Yeah. Yeah. And Spider Man yeah. is this year. Yep. Spider Man is this year? Spider- this year or next year? Spider Man is this year, if I remember correctly. Oh, wow. I think Spider Man is December. Um, wow, which means I might I not be right next up, year. I might not be right on Shang Chi then. Maybe Shang Chi did get delayed. But and uh, is Spider Man going to be this this multiverse thing they've been hinting at? Or? They haven't we don't know that yet. They haven't said. However, they did okay. reveal the name of the movie. Yeah, uh, which is what uh, can't come. No way home. No way home. Yeah, which does kind of imply being lost in the multiverse. Yeah. Um. So yeah, if everything we've been hearing is correct, then that's the case. Yeah, July 9th, twenty twenty one is Shang Chi. Um, so the month that, uh, two months after Black Widow, we get Shang-Chi. You know, if I may, uh, just totally out of my butt here, but what I'd love to see them do with Spider-Man, uh, eventually, mm-hmm. I mean, we're getting a Joe Jonah Jameson, which is overdue and I'm oh, yeah. thrilled for that. Um, I would love, again, this would take time though, like oh, it's over multiple movies. I'd love to see them build up. A, a good peer relationship with either MJ or bring in Harry mm-hmm. or best of all, bring in Gwen yeah. and develop that. And and then you, you do for the first time, completely write the green goblin. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I, I would love to see that. I mean, they, I don't know if they may, they may never do that, but um, I, it, it just it hasn't been done properly as far as I'm concerned. I agree so, with you. I don't think it would work in this iteration. Yeah. I think, I think we'll get green goblin in, as some sort Eventually, um, yeah, I hope we do get it as close to right as possible. But I do yeah. agree with Shane, though, that it may have been done one too many times. Yeah. Um, no, that's, the, that's that's why I, I'm I'm you know despairing because it, yeah. it, it's been so they went to that well so many times and so quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and it really pains me to see Willem Dafoe's original costume mask whatever that would have been so much better than what we got <laughs> yeah I, I mean i loved how he acted don't, don't get tremendous. me wrong i thought he was great no, was but tremendous. the costume was the, ridiculous <laughs> the way they did that was, was horrendous compared yeah. to what you now see as this is what it should have been and this is what we were working at and it, it looks phenomenal well luckily with the power of zoom i can show that to the listeners anybody Ooh. who's on who's on uh because uh, uh, you know what, I've never seen this. Uh, uh, see this. I think I may have shown it to you one time before, Chris. But this, this. Oh was, yes, you have shown me. Yep, yeah, so much better. This is the, ori- <laughs> the original look, and that it was very much more, you know, comic book than Power Rangers. But what's great yeah. about that look is, yeah, the actor can is acting th- with that mask. Yeah. That intensifies the terror and the madness of, of the goblin. Well, and especially with yeah. a guy like Willem Dafoe who can do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would have just made so much more sense, but not the way they decided to go. Say lovey. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will share going back to uh, WandaVision for a moment. We mentioned her, her, you know, her final look, and how oh, I loved it. Amazing, it loved was. it. Yeah. Loved it. And see, the only thing that I wish yeah, is that so good. It was a little bit. Of, if only it had been a little bit of a lighter shade of red, a shade of red. Mm. Well, see, I like I like darker maroon, so I I, I was okay with it. But I know what you're saying; it, yeah. it's not quite that dark in comics. Yeah, she's yeah. not the maroon magician; she is the Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Yes, and, and the the drop of the name Scarlet Witch too, the way that they actually yeah, went that, about I it. That. Mm. Oh, that yes. was weighted, man. Whew. So good. <laughs> Ac- well, actually, giving it purpose. Yeah, you know, rather than just naming the character, because you know they, they set up earlier on in the show that she's never had a code name. Um, which is true. She's, yeah. only, she's, she's only ever been Wanda. You see, that, that moment you just referenced there, Ian, that is another thing that it was a red herring to me. Because mm-hmm. when, when Director Hayward dropped that question in the middle of his debriefing, it, it was kind of a leading question. It was almost like he, ex- he was expecting to be told Scarlet Witch. Yeah. And then Jimmy Woo just kind of looked at him and was like, no, she's, she's just Wanda. And uh, I, I, that's what made me think, <laughs> incorrectly, of course, that Hayward might turn out to be Immortus, right? In the end. Oh, because ex- anticipating the Scarlet Witch moniker might suggest he had knowledge of yeah. this reality that would come from a position outside, like as of a time traveler or a visitor from another dimension. Cons- considering, did- yeah, cons- considering that we are getting Kang at some point, you know. Hmm. I mean, hey, you never, you never know. <laughs> nice. And Immortus did officiate at Wanda and Vision's wedding in the comics, so it would have would have made sense. But again, what do I know? <laughs> so, if if people want to read more into the background of what we're talking about. This Avengers trade, it's been reproduced many times. The Knights of Wondegore, the Yesterday Quest. Um, 
essential of reading. Uh, it's uh, John Byrne, David Michelini stuff, Mark Runewald. But it goes into, the, into those, like the magic side of Wanda's history, at least in the comic universe. It's classic stuff. Yeah. So and, and the the other the other thing that I wanted to bring up is I mean talking about the red herrings and stuff like that. I I feel like this this series works so well as a week to week scenario, mm-hmm. mostly because of those red herrings because it got anticipation up so high. And you're like, oh my god, where are they going next on this? Like, like, is it this? Is it that? Is it that? Is it that? Whether you knew the comics or not, you know, all these theories are running about. Like, it brought back week to week television for the first time in mm. years. Well, I think Mandalorian did that first. That's fair. That's fair. in a lot of ways. Yeah, very good. But point. I do think WandaVision was broader viewed yeah. by non specific people like a lot of Star Wars people and a lot of non Star Wars people watched Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. I think more non comic book readers read uh, watched WandaVision than the other way with Mandalorian. Yeah. Just my opinion. What do we think of how they applied Monica Rambeau and her uh uh gaining her powers? I liked it. And it's- uh, it's the kind of uh, – I'm even going to go ahead and say lazy uh, excuse for uh, <laughs> the bestowal of powers that, that Roy Thomas used to write into his stories all the time, just to you know, mention his name again in the course of this episode. Yeah, it's just she, Okay, she passed through Wanda's hex field, and now she has whatever powers uh, the, the, uh, the showrunners want her to have. Well, I kind of wonder, w- would it make sense that she had that spark from what happened in the Captain Marvel movie and Wanda's powers just triggered it? Uh well well we never really saw the kid display any sort of powers though you know like no uh, I mean I mean yes she did get, oh, wait, was she was she on the ship I'm trying to remember where or did they leave her behind uh, she was no they left her behind yeah Ooh. yes Excuse me. so like no, I, I did leave her behind yeah so I, I can't really think of anything that in that movie in particular that would have led to this um however one thing that they didn't really mention as much is whether or not the snap may have somehow also related to this. Because she's had her atoms rearranged like four mm. times. Yeah. You know, she disappeared in the snap, then she came good, back. Uh, you know, that's a good observation. She, yeah. went, she went into the field, then she came out. She went into the field, then she came out. She went into the field. And you know that I think that may have very well been one of the contributing factors to, you know, to her getting her abilities like this. And... I love that because of the sword, the, because of the, the sword, the S word, uh, mm-hmm. be, because because of the sword costume, it sort of evokes her costume. It's with, very evocative mm-hmm. of it, absolutely. Yeah, without absolutely. actually going there, I, I I really appreciated that. So let's see, I'm going to call her Photon Spectrum. Well, her, I'm not going to call her Captain Marvel. Her code name was Photon. Uh, oh, was it? Okay, yeah. I didn't catch that. Uh, right, like like her her flying moniker was uh, was was photon. Mm-hmm. They said that. Call sign. Yeah, her call sign. Thank you. Uh, was was photon. So I think they'll just stick with that uh, for All the right. most part. Yeah. Um. But and reveal also didn't even think. Oh, of course we're going to get scrolls. You know, like that didn't even that didn't even occur yeah. to me. Um, yeah. And then lo and behold, we get scrolls. So <laughs> I guess that is as close as a as a as a as a true movie gimmick that you got in here was yeah. the scrolls coming in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, because she's going to go off and obviously meet with Nick Fury. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Avengers Initiative Part Two is already in motion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, and she's also supposed to be in Captain Marvel too. Um. So wh- whether whether she shows up in Secret Invasion first or whether she shows up in Captain Marvel two. Either way, she's going to have scroll, you know, things going on. I would have liked, and this is just more my sappiness, I would have liked if through going in and out of the field when she was struggling so badly that time and, and things seemed to be happening, I would have liked us a, a quick little flashback with her mom, newly filmed, mm. so we could just see her in this. Yeah, Shane, I, I mean, love I know they sappiness. were referenced, but I, I just would have liked that. I yeah. Know that. No, that's 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 fair. Um, I, I also wouldn't be surprised if we get more of her mom in Captain I'm sure. Marvel, in Captain Marvel two. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Just just because I think there'll at least be one scene between her mom and Carol. Uh, yeah. Because I guarantee you, while she was snapped, Carol came to see her mom before her mom passed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because like I, it it didn't it doesn't seem like a scenario where like Carol would have missed all of that. No. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I I think they did an excellent job here. Um, every single song is stuck in my head to this very day, um, and it will be for some time to come. 
And frankly, Falcon and Winter Soldier has some very big shoes to fill. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it with breathless anticipation. Yeah. I think it's going to cobble its own pair of shoes, personally. <laughs> mm-hmm. Nice. It's not going to try to fill those shoes. It's just going to go off in its own direction. Yeah. And, and one more MCU question. How many episodes that series going to be? I'm sorry, Mer, go ahead. It's probably eight or nine. Pro- yeah, I, I would assume pretty much all of these shows are going to be about eight or nine episodes, uh, give or take. Because uh, I think generally if you take all the time that makes the shows, you get an extended movie. And that's really what they go for, in my opinion. Because, I mean, if it was a movie, you would not have had the first two episodes of WandaVision be as extensive as they were in the movie. You would have had trimmed down versions or a combination of those. But the rest of the whole show would have played out in a movie. Yeah. Uh, murder, fairly easily. Actually, it's going to be six, according to... Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so That's this this one... better. Yep, exactly. That's even shorter. Yeah, nice a nice tight story. So that that's yeah. what I'm looking forward to. Um, yeah. What's the? Uh, didn't I hear that Chris Evans wants to re- take on the mantle again? Uh, that there, there'll be rumors until the end of time whether okay. or, whether or not whether or not <laughs> whether or not he actually does. You know, we shall see whether or not we get an old cap. You know, just giving you know fatherly advice to people mm. uh, is, is another way that they could go with this because I don't think we're going to suddenly yeah. get a young Chris Evans. Again. I, I, I dig seeing old Cap in action that way. Yeah, um, but you know, and we'll, Black we'll Panther see. too. They announced they're not going to have a, a Black Panther in it, right? Or well, at least no one's going to take up the mantle. No one is going to take Maybe? up Chadwick Boseman's mantle. Yes, there will okay. not be T'Challa. It doesn't mean we're not going to get Black Panther because we could very yeah. easily get his sister in the role. Right. Um, but they've been very cagey about what's going to be in Black Panther 2. Um, I know it's slated for next year, uh, but we have Thor, Love and Thunder before that, and I don't think they've even started production yet on Black Panther, so it's uh, it's a long way to go. God, I was, watch- I was watching the first Black Panther. It's such a good movie. It is, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. And uh, some some set shots from Thor: Love and Thunder so far say that you know we are going to get some as Guardians of the Galaxy action, uh, <laughs> as uh, as uh, it looks like we're definitely getting Star Lord in at least a couple of scenes. So that'll that'll be that'll be super fun. <laughs> is yep. Hemsworth supposed to be in that too? In in Guardians or of the no. Galaxy? Uh, no, no, in in Thor: Love and Thunder. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. He is. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. Yeah, no, so. he, uh, yeah, he's filming the scenes. An incredibly, incredibly buff Natalie Portman uh, is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is is already filming on set. I've seen some pictures of her. Like, she looks like she has been doing nothing but working out while in isolation. <laughs> like, it, it is amazing. You think it's all natural muscle or prosthetics? I think it's mostly natural muscle murd. Like, it, like it, it looked like, like those forearms were legit. Like, I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's probably gonna be some padding in the costume, but they did a really good job of, of getting her in shape. I think she's on the Hugh Jackman diet, essentially. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. But uh, yeah, I think for a first Disney Plus outing for Marvel. Oh, yeah. This, oh, knocked that out of the park. This couldn't have been yep. any better. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yep. Because again, they, they, they I don't know if you'd say to take a risk because, you know, it's. It's Disney, but but they they, they took on a storyline that yeah. you know outside of people like us, nobody really knows about that those stories at all. And 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 they did. I think they did justice to them. Like they, they didn't they didn't like take like a a quick little side exit and try to chicken out. Like they really went for it. I mean, they, yeah. they really showed you how dangerous she is. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, there's the pathos and, and you feel sympathy for her, but at the same time, you're like, wow, she's like she's like basically. Uh, potentially this this weapon that that could mm-hmm. rewrite all reality yep. um, um, God. So, yeah, yeah yeah so they, they they really went for it i loved it and from that final scene there you know with her at the you know secluded uh uh cabin we see her essentially doing what dr strange oh, did yeah. in his first movie you know yeah. a- astral projecting learning more while it's at the same time going about her business um yeah. and we hear in the background the cries of her children which says to me that, you know, the multiverse of madness, I think we know where we're going with this, you know? Like, is she going to be the true, you know, the true villain of multiverse of madness? We don't know. We don't know. So it's going to be really interesting. It. Yep. Um, one more comment that I have to make, uh, it, spring, springboarding off what you said, Chris, is this is a show that I can say benefited from the pandemic delays because I think that had we gotten uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier first, this show would have landed differently. 
because it's that unique mm-hmm. and it's that different. I feel like they needed a show like this to start things off for 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 the Disney Plus Marvel shows. I think if we had gotten something more traditionally Marvel movie, then I don't know how well this show would have landed because expectations would have been different. Um, and I think if this was not a few years ago, that would have still worked. But if it was a couple years from now, I kind of wonder if the sitcom side of it would have died away a little bit because mm-hmm. those kinds of reruns are getting further and further away from being easily viewed right. unless you know what you're looking and, for. And they're receding in, 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 in memory too because yeah. – you know, most people who are significantly younger than us, most of them are not familiar with any of those shows. Yeah. No. Well, there's always no. some people who are, but most people are not. So, you know, like I, I'll keep making jokes in the show about what's happening, but <laughs> people don't know what <laughs> yeah. the hell I'm talking about. So I'm, come on. I'm still disappointed, though, that two of my predictions didn't happen, that we didn't get a two broke girls riff with uh, with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, w- w- with Darcy, you know, that she wasn't working at a diner when she got into the, uh, <laughs> you know, into the WandaVision stuff. Uh, although mm-hmm. I did enjoy her in the essentially the Loki chains, as I'd like to call them, because it's the same chains that both Thor and Loki were in, essentially, in, in their own movies. She had to get herself out of. Yeah. Um, but also that we didn't get Phil Dumpty. You know, we could have very easily gotten Doc Samson in oh, in, wow. in this show, and they're doing a yeah. Modern Family riff. You know, it, it, it's it's too <laughs> it's too easy to have him in there, but either they didn't think of it or they didn't want it. But that would have just made me so happy because we're, again, we're getting we're getting Blonsky back. You know, we're getting Abomination back, so that that Hulk movie still exists. In the in the oh, con- yeah. in, in continuity. Oh, yeah. Well, I Absolutely. always thought it did because yeah. even in the first Avengers movie, he mentions uh, Bruce Banner says about how the last time I was in New York, I right. just I just always thought that was in there. Oh, yeah, sure. plus, t- plus Tony appears in the in the, in the yeah yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's just it's the least mentioned one, mostly mm-hmm. because they don't actually have the rights to it in the same way. Um, yeah, no. You know, I, I, oh really? What, what do you what do you mean by that? Uh, that, that Sony. That was well, no, it wasn't Sony. It was Universal. Um, ah. uh, they they had a a split distribution deal oh, at the time okay. uh, okay. with Universal. So that's why, like, of all the Marvel movies, that's the only one that works with Voodoo's, uh, you know, disc to digital because it's still technically oh. a Universal movie. So I was able to get a digital copy of that, um, <laughs> which is also why you don't see it on, you know, Disney Plus and stuff like that because the uh, the distribution deal itself is different. Yeah. So What... um. You know what? I'm feeling my advanced middle age. I was about to say something. I just totally brain farted. <laughs> well, wh- why? Why? While, while you while you uh, while you think about getting us off your lawn, uh, how many <laughs> how many freaking sewers do we give the series uh, out of uh, out of the standard five? Uh, what, oh, what, five what? without question. Oh, yeah. Yep, seems like a five to me too. It's yeah. a, it, it, a straight up five. Yeah, yeah. I was I was entertained. This was a show that made me get up at eight a.m. on a Friday and watch it before I started work. Just to ensure that I would not get spoiled, like that. You know, <laughs> that says a lot. I, it's it's pretty easy for me to stay away from social media because I don't go on it during the day when I'm at work. So I had no no reservations about being spoiled because there's no way I really could have been. But it just like the Mandalorian, it was fun to have because my older one watched WandaVision more than my younger one. It was still fun on a Friday night after dinner for him to say, "Hey, let's watch let's watch WandaVision." Yeah. Because there there was a span of time where we watched Flash all the time together, and then that that kind of died away over the last year or two that Flash was on. Mm-hmm. Um, to get that back with the Mandalorian and then with WandaVision, I, I'm looking forward to Winter Soldier coming back to to get that again yeah. Friday night after dinner, watching something with one of the kids or both of them. Well, you have a week. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're doing a very good job of uh, of having having us have stuff to watch on a Friday. So yep, yep. All right. Well, speaking of speaking of TV, since you went ahead and mentioned Flash, um, has anybody else watched the first two episodes of the new season? I've watched the first. Was it just the first episode of the Flash I watched, okay. and the first two of Superman and Lois? Okay, I've I've seen the I have first. Not watched Batwoman yet. I've seen the first two of Superman and Lois. Uh, Murd, how many have you seen? I've seen all three of uh, this first season and uh, the the first and most of the second episodes of The Flash. Wow. 6.5. Adam's ahead of me on TV. Holy cow. Uh, how about that? <laughs> Chris, I assume you're still three seasons. I, I assume you're still three seasons behind on all of them. Yeah. The, the DC shows, and, and this is, I mean, outside of when we watched Crisis, which I thoroughly enjoyed, we did mm-hmm. that uh, 
actually it was right before the pandemic, wasn't it? Last yeah. Year. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've given up on all that because it, even though I like it, because it, if I, if I start to try to watch all this stuff, I start to have this existential crisis about what I'm doing with my life. So um, that's <laughs> well, only about me, not a reflection of anybody well, else. So uh, I'm, I'm probably never going to return to them. I'll, t- I'll tell you this, Chris. If you do return to any of them, because yeah. I, know, I know what you like and I know, I know your favorite heroes, Superman and Lois is by far the best Superman since, In a long since, time. since the Reeves. Wow. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got some gravitas to it. Yeah. It really so that, that just started, right? That just yeah. started. Yeah. We're yep. three and episodes in. Oh, I can probably seems, catch up to that then. It seems to me that – so Superman was on Supergirl, and we know what happens there a little bit. Yeah. It seems to me this takes place like 10 years later. Well, see, the thing is though, it doesn't, and that's only because of Crisis. Uh, well, true, true. Crisis rewrote the universe, and I remember this when we were when we were watching, uh, you know, the Crisis on Infinite Earths. When they went from Lois being, uh, you know, just having a kid to suddenly them having two kids. Yeah. Um, so I think that when the universe was rewritten, they suddenly went from having a, a toddler to having teenagers. Um, yeah, you're and, right, and that allowed them to then. Because at the end, show. at the end, she calls him and says about the boys. Right. Yeah. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and now is that show on CW? Yes. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah. But but it's backed by HBO Max. Oh, so good, because I hate the so CW it's got a very large budget. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It, so and it, it shows. I'll say it has Star Girl budget. Like yeah. You, you know you know how beautiful Star Girl was. Yeah. Like this is some of the best special effects you've seen with Superman in quite some time. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll at least watch the first one. Is it on CW or HBO Max? Uh, it, it's, on, it's, on, it's on CW, and I'm about to make it even more worth your while, actually, Ooh, because titillation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show something that's a little bit of a spoiler to the first that's episode. Um, but let me see if I can find it. And for people listening and watching, spoiler. Oh, yeah. Yep, <laughs> definitely. But, yeah, here we are. I think I found it. Okay. Uh, in the very first episode of the series, we see this as they're introducing Superman. That's his very first costume. Oh. <laughs> and, and the scene that he uses it in is spectacular. Yeah. They, they, do, wow. they do a Grant Morrison-esque introduction to the history of Superman where he talks about landing and yeah. meeting his parents. Right. And I'll, then, I'll check this out. And, and, it's I can, it's I can really good. It oh my god. And, and, and of course, you know, when he saves the child in this scene and we see the Fleischer, uh, you know, for those of you on audio, we see a Fleischer-esque Superman costume that he's wearing and a kid is like, cool costume. And he said, thanks, my mom made it. And then flies yeah. off. <laughs> it's It's outstanding. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thanks, Ian. Yep. I mean, I like I like all the iterations of Superman in some capacity, but this one's really good. It really is. Yeah. The only the only problem I have with it is that uh, he really needs to shave, and I know that that's the actor because uh, uh, Tyler Coachum, I think his name is, uh, just has a like forever a five o'clock shadow. Like no matter what he does. By the way, he he as a young boy, he was in the, the Tom Hanks classic. Uh, Road to Perdition. Oh, really? He Maybe. played Tom Hanks' son. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow! In that film, with, also with Paul Newman. That's a, and that's that's based on a graphic novel too, actually. Right? Yes, yeah, it yeah. is. Yep. Um, Excellent. But uh, that that's when I I remember I was reading about him in Superman, and I realized, wait, that's the same actor. <laughs> oh, wow. like I don't know he's like twelve or thirteen. In, yeah, in yeah. Road to Perdition. I knew he was in oh, Teen cool. Wolf. I didn't realize he was in Road to Perdition. So go figure. I mean, triple check me. You know, I'm almost. I'm I'm 99 positive he was the kid in Road to. Perdition. I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and check that now. But yeah, yeah. yeah I I believe you. Yep. Yeah. If anybody wants, to, if anybody's ever seen Road to Perdition, you love seeing adaptations of like non superhero comics. This is an outstanding. I mean, it's Tom Hanks and Paul Newman for Pete's sake. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so, he he was also on the on the TV show Seventh Heaven. I didn't know that either. So yeah, go go oh. figure. Yep. <laughs> He's coming home to the CW network. Yes, he is. Yeah, yes, right. He is. Right. Yep. Back back then, I guess it was the WB. Right. Ah, <laughs> uh, the dub 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 WB. But uh, uh, for Flash, also, uh, I'd say the most recent season. While you can tell they're working with COVID standards because the first episode legitimately has like four actors in it, um, yeah. I I think that they're doing a decent job. 
and and they're dealing with not being able to finish the previous season the way they wanted to and trying to make it work for the beginning of this season. Right. They're they're doing a good job with that. And Flash always was my favorite. I always thought I mean I I've, I've watched all of the shows in the end. I've enjoyed them for the most part. I do though think Flash was the most the, the best well done and the most well rounded of all the shows so far because it wasn't as dark as ours. So I could always sit with the kids when they were younger and watched it and they loved it. Mm-hmm. And it was fun and bright compared to almost anything DC at that time when it came out being yeah. dark and grim. I just, I just think it, it was, it's more easily easy. It's a show that's easier to have anybody watch it and not be mired down in things to me. Yeah. And what, what season is it on now? Seven. Yep. Oh my god! Yeah, that, oh, the oh, oh, the oh, thing oh. about this 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 most recent episode, the uh, episode two, is one one of the main problems the Flash has been has been facing in the last season or so is that he's been losing his super speed, partially because of Crisis, like like because of damage that he made to the Speed Force. The Speed Force has been deteriorating, so he yeah. has to manufacture his own. And in the most recent episode, due to due to making this new Speed Force, he accidentally gives him speed thinking which you'd think would be a good thing <laughs> except for the fact that it eventually takes away his emotions yeah um such a contrived consequence of this uh, new power it's oh just, i know yeah it's the writers giving themselves an excuse to use his super thinking to get them out of help them write themselves out of this predicament yeah but there's this kind of a kill switch in there that uh, gives him an excuse to take the power away because it would make it almost impossible to create uh, you know, <laughs> threats and problems that barry couldn't solve in uh, you know the blink of an eye exactly afterwards yep and it's it's not without its faults but but i do enjoy that show more than all the others overall the entire season, season to season. Yep. And, and, and I'm looking forward to, apparently, there's been talk that in Stargirl season two, yes. we, we may be getting Green Lantern. We may be getting Ooh. Alan, uh, either whether it be Jade or our Alan Scott, but either well, way. Well, and, and, and uh, Old Flash, too. Jay Garrick Flash. Yep. Yes. And Johnny Thunder's got to be out there. That uh, that pink pen is still in, in the mix. Yep. That is yep. very true. Most yep. importantly, we'll definitely be getting... <laughs> yes yes eclipso yes wow <laughs> talk about oh, Mer, did you know drama. we were going to talk about that when you put the shirt on <laughs> a- apparently so for a television budget because he can literally be anyone mm-hmm. exactly all it's all it takes is just a, a little bit of paint on the face and then that, mm-hmm. that's about it maybe a spockier on one side and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Murd, I, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to uh, jump past it. Did you have any uh, further thoughts on uh, Superman and Lois that you wanted to share? Uh, well, I'm I'm really enjoying it too. It's it's a great Superman for uh, this period in history. I think it's it's not at all the show I was expecting us to get no. uh, because going in, I knew nothing about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't even. The biggest surprise for me was that Superman and Lois had kids yeah. this time around. I yeah. thought we were going to get something more like uh, a more contemporary and less cheesy version of the old Dean Cain and Terry Hatcher show. <laughs> Instead, it's I think given the fact that it's almost as much at least as much about uh, Jordan and Jonathan, the Supermans, as it is about Superman and Lois, they might as well have called the show like the Super Sons or the Superman family or Mm -hmm. Smallville the Next Generation. (laughs) (laughs) That's basically what it is. I mean, the the one thing that disappointed me the most about it, I think, is that they, it's it's set in Smallville. They're back in a rural area instead Mm -hmm. of living their lives in Metropolis. Yeah. And that's probably justified by the fact that it's cheaper to film in rural areas, I assume, than it is in a city. Right. I would think. Uh, but yeah, but it's, it, it's a great take on Superman. They, they get his character, his relationship with Lois and, you know, the trials and tribulations of being a father. Very, they, they get it just right. I think, um, the playing him as a father figure makes sense because he's, there's always been kind of a paternalistic aspect to the character, you know, this super powerful or even divine father figure watching out for the entire world. And now they're leaning into that by having him literally raise some kids, yeah. Um, yeah. And so the, the downside of that, I guess, is that uh, some younger it, it, it kind of confirms uh, so some younger viewers attitude that Superman is like uh, your dad's generation superhero because now he's literally a dad. But <laughs> still, I think it's it's the approach to the character that's going to work best for this medium in the 2020s. They, 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 it's still recogn- very much recognizably the Clark Kent we know and love. He's, he's adapting to fatherhood with all its you know, bumps in the road very yeah. well. And uh, the action scenes are also quite good. So rest assured, those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, he does still – there's a bad guy or two for him to fight. 
I'm yep. looking forward to this. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's, again, it's on a, a, a larger than average television budget. So it, it yeah. looks And although we don't get red suit, uh, you know, red tights, uh, they went with the rebirth suit for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, And it works really, really nicely on screen. I I have to tell you, he he looks he looked fine when he appeared in Supergirl, but he just looks better. I don't know if it's the suit that they tweaked or as he worked out or Mm -hmm. whatever combination of it. He he really does look so much better. That's good good to hear in the show. I, I felt when I saw him in Supergirl, I'm, I mean, I really like the actor, but I, I just felt physically he looked a little underwhelming to be Superman. Mm. Well, they also, they, they also can't help the fact that he's short. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but they play that off in some capacity with shoes, lifts, something, because he looks taller in this. Yeah. yeah there's, there's all kinds of tricks that can be tried. But yeah, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think but both on the part of uh, Tyler Hecklin and the showrunners of Supergirl, uh, they were, I think, probably trying a little bit to prevent him from upstaging, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Melissa Benoist as the title character of that show. Sure. Yeah, they don't sure. have that limitation here. So oh, one yeah. one one qualm that I'll have with it uh, is in the very first episode. It's not that big of a spoiler to say this because I mean, obviously you know, had to, they had to get back to Smallville somehow. Uh Martha Martha Kent passes away in the first episode. It's it's very early on. It's it's a it's basically oh. their moving point to get back to Smallville. Yeah, and the right. fact that Supergirl is not actually at the funeral kind of upset me a little bit. Yeah, yeah. not a, not a single mention of cousin Kara in the first three episodes. Yeah, yeah. Exa- exactly. Yeah. Like uh, you would have thought that she would have at least been there, even if they just had to have her have a cameo and then run off and do something else. Yeah, it, it just made or- sense, but. Not, didn't just happen. have Lois or Clark mention that she sends her regrets but couldn't make it. Just exactly. Acknowledge that she exists in this universe as she must. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But eh, what are you going to do? Also, it suddenly reminds me that uh, the one issue I had with WandaVision was that they screwed up the timeline a little bit. Uh, that they they had her uh, when as a kid when she was when she was uh, going ruffling through those DVDs and what have you. Um, the Sokovia stuff was supposed to happen in like 96 or 98, if I remember correctly. And Malcolm mm-hmm. in the Middle didn't premiere until 2000. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that timeline was sped up. <laughs> That's exactly the way that I wrote uh, it off, and I, 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 I mailed myself a no prize. Levenstein nitpick. I look forward to it every every discussion. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, yeah, no, there's, there's some really good uh, – it's nice to see TV back. Um, and I'm happy to see it, it back in, in, you know, full form and, and doing very well for us. So, yep, makes me very happy. Yeah. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to transition over to, to the latest DC offering. Uh, please. Before we, before we get into further comics, um, you know, post Dark Knight's, uh, death metal, we have ourselves the Infinite Frontier. And, uh... I show the credits page on the video because there's a lot in this. Uh, we get <laughs> we get Justice League by Bendis and Marquez. We get Superman by Philip Kennedy Johnson and some schlub named Jamal Eigel. Uh, <laughs> we get uh, Bat- Batman by James Tinney in the fourth and Jorge Jimenez. A Green Arrow and Black Canary by Joshua Williamson and Alex Maleev. Oh wow. Uh, Wonder Woman by Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad, art by Aletha Great. Martinez. Star Girl by Jeff Johns and Todd Nock. Oh wow! Oh, <laughs> wow. Uh, Joel Jones writing and drawing Wonder Girl. Uh, that's the uh, the uh, Flores uh, Wonder Girl. Uh, oh. Green Lanterns by Jeffrey Thorne and Dexter Soy. Green Lantern Alan Scott by James Tinney and the Fourth and Stephen Byrne. Flash by Williamson and Porter. So one of the last times we'll see Williamson and Porter oh, wow. doing, doing Flash for a while. Teen Titans Academy by Tim Sheridan and uh, uh, Rafa Sandoval and Jordi Tarragona. And an epilogue by Joshua Williamson and frickin' Ramita Jr. and Klaus Janssen. Oh. <laughs> so they, so they, they, they had the big guns on this one. Um hmm. And, and it works like you know it works like uh, like Rebirth did, where you know we're getting essentially character vignettes. You know we're getting little pieces of stories that are going to be happening in further volumes of these characters. But more than anything else, and the biggest focus that I have on this, outside of the fact that Wonder Woman is sort of like the spectral guide throughout this, because after the events of Dark Knight's Death Metal, uh, she was given the option to essentially become a god. And now she gets to look in on, on her fellow heroes and decide whether or not she's going to take that offer or be back with them. 
Uh, you can kind of guess what happens in the end because she's Wonder Woman. Uh, but uh, the Green Lantern, Alan Scott portion of this. Number one, Jade and Obsidian are back, baby. Uh, uh, there you go, Ian. That's number one. Number two, Infinity Inc. are back, baby. Wow. Oh, wow. Nerd. Yep. Number three, Justice Society of America, back. Mm-hmm. Well, well, we knew. We knew, but like they're super back now. Like they're really, okay, really good. back. Um, super back is better than regular back. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> Alan Scott's Sentinel identity is back. Oh, gosh. A twist. Yeah. And they decided to do something which I was not actually expecting. Um, essentially joining James Robinson's version of Alan Scott in the Earth 2 quote-unquote reboot from the New 52 with this one, Alan Scott comes out as gay. Huh. And he does so to Jade and Obsidian. And Obsidian essentially says to his father, I was waiting for you to, to, to join me on this. Mm. Um, and yeah, he says that he's been hiding things for from them for quite some time and that, uh, you know, he he hopes that they're OK with it. And of course they are. And they they accept him for what he is. And and he's going to be essentially be the sentinel over at the watchtower uh, guarding things and possibly part of this new Justice League team that's going to be sort of like a uh, an outside force rather than a Earth force. So, um, Ian, is, is this book meant as a introduction to a like a new continuity, essentially? In ways, yes, uh, because that's kind of that's kind of what the uh, what they're doing over at DC in general is continuity itself is very fluid over at DC now, uh, um, yeah. to say the least. Yeah, but this is our main continuity that they're setting up. Here. I see. Okay, yeah, where like a lot of pre fifty two stuff is reset and back, like Justice Society and, and what have you. But there's still inklings of what came before, you know, like Jonathan Kent is still around and, you know, running around, but we also have Connor, you know, we have... So they're, just, they're kind of picking and choosing stuff from different periods and yes. throwing it all in. Gotcha. Continuity a la carte. But they, <laughs> but, but they also established this weird-ass thing called the Linearverse. The uh, Linearverse now. Yes. Well, oh, that, that's, that's, that's from... Uh, uh, the Watchmen sequel we were talking about, right? So that was the metaverse. That was the metaverse. Oh, that was the metaverse. Yeah. The yeah. Sorry, I, I think it's something that uh, Jurgens came up with and threw out there. It is uh, generations uh, forged things that he's been doing. It is, and it's it's the it's the most recent thing that came out, and it, it was supposed to sort of like lead into what would have originally been our you know quote unquote continuity reboot pre the Dio's firing, but instead <laughs> it's sort of a side thing where. Batman has existed since the 30s, and so has Superman, and they're just aging really slowly. Oh, so which is fine for Superman. Wait, I get that. That's a premise for this. This is the premise that like that's all interesting. All the heroes <laughs> that you know have existed as long as they've existed. So like any, you could throw in any event that that's happened, and it happened to them, um, wow. and that they have all this experience. Um, I have no idea how they're going to work with this, but this is like <laughs> their own thing. <laughs> or if. Or if, exactly. But it's thrown out there like Hyper Time was thrown out there, and it's like the the extra like nugget in your huh. in your six piece. Like you got your seventh piece in a six piece, a six piece, piece nuggets. Um and there's also a world called Else World out there, which I think is kind of like the culmination of the, of the dark multiverse. Where like anything could be, and like that's basically your what if world. Um, but hey, DC Comics, and and that's that's kind of all I care about at this point is like, can I get the characters that I truly enjoy doing things that I want them to do? And the answer is yes. While at the same time, also not just catering to me because you know I know for a fact that I'm in my 30s and I need stuff to actually get younger audiences in. And I'm hoping that'll still wind up happening here with stuff like, uh, you know, Damien's new Robin book and, uh, you know, new takes on Batman and, and Superman and, you know, stuff like that. So it's going to be a really well, Ian, interesting couple admittedly, of Admittedly, I, I don't share your optimism, but I'm rooting for it. <laughs> I, I, am, I am hoping just for the creators alone that are involved with this process that mm. we're going to get some good stuff. Um, I think it's a good crop over at DC right now. 
Oh, I don't doubt the quality. I'm talking about getting new young readers. Oh, well, yes, <laughs> of, of course. But, you know, that, that also all stems on digital and stuff like, you know, how well DC Infinite does to, to get people in and stuff like that, because that's a really yeah. cheap way to read comics. And Shane, did you know that you could read them on the browser now? No, because I never really cared to do that or not, because I read them on the iPad. Fair enough, fair enough. But I, I, th- there have been times where I've, you know, I've been sitting at my computer for, you know, one reason or another, and, I, and I'm able to, you know, multitask, and I can go ahead and bring up the DC Infinite app, sorry, the oh. DC Infinite website, and just scroll on my, on my, you know, on my browser and read stuff, which is pretty cool. I'll tell you, I usually end up, partially because of my eyes getting bad, mm. as I, even with glasses, I usually end up reading stuff... This way, sideways. Ah, and zoomed in? A little bit. It's taking too long to load. <laughs> Shane, let me raise a glass and commiseration as we both approach 50 oh, feet of light. You're not kidding. <laughs> faster and faster as time may go. Any, any of you who've been dra- seeing me uh, sip on this bourbon all night, by the way, that's been the, uh, the Statesman bourbon that, uh, that old Forrester made <laughs> for, the, uh, for the Statesman movie, so... Comic book appropriate drink. Go figure. Yeah. So, like, I usually read it and just scroll up. I don't have to expand it anymore like I was. Mm -hmm. And I kind of can read it in bed. I just kind of rest it looking up. And oh, yeah. I don't know. It's it's just much more comfortable to read it sideways. And it's just a little bigger than comic size. Mm -hmm. But I I really enjoy reading stuff on here. Um, Again, still some things I like to read in, in, in paper physical form, but. I like the option of having Marvel Unlimited and DC's Infinite whatever now. Yeah. To not pay five, six, whatever dollars per issue mm-hmm. or whatever with a discount because it's still expensive with a discount. Um, yeah. I still get some, but I'm I'm down to five to ten books a month now, physical, and the rest I'll just read on here. Well, I I, I I wait for those sales on trade paperbacks uh, sure. for you know stuff like Image and what have you. But yeah. then, as for for the most part, DC and Marvel, I do exactly what you're saying, Shane. I just go ahead and read them on the app, and and that's yep. that's what works for me. And there's very few times I'm not six months behind on my books anyway. So for me to wait, <laughs> that's nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, speaking of comic books, uh, Chris, what have you been reading? Oh, I'm looking forward to the discussion, gentlemen. I have a pile of stuff mm-hmm. to uh, promote here, and in, in my, you know, my always enthusiastic fashion. Uh, first of all, I mentioned this before. So I read issues one through six of Stillwater by Chip Zdarsky and uh, I think it's Ramon Perez. Um, watch this book. This is going to be, if it continues on the path it is, it's going to be one of the most exciting and best comics being produced right now. There's no question in my mind it's going to be a TV series eventually because it's clearly designed to be one. And I mean that not as, as a compliment, not as a put down. Um, Chip Zdarsky is clearly something that he's probably been, I'm sure, has been thinking about and working on for a long time. Um, we've been, I've been praising him as a writer for the past few years, this is him taking it up to even another notch. It's a slow burn. Um, and I mean that again, in the best possible way. Again, it's a guy is drawn back to a town because of the history of, of his mother. And when he crosses the borders of the town, he finds that nobody in the town can actually die. And they're all kind of stuck at a certain point. Like some of the kids are like, have adult sensibilities, but they're kids. And he starts to realize that, once the, the the knowledge this town has about itself, so that they will they will go to virtually any length to protect themselves from the outside world, and that's it. Just go with that story, and then you, you put this fly on the ointment, who's this guy from the outside world who's been drawn back in because of his family ties to the town, and then and then he how he tries to now navigate what's happening because since he's he's an offspring, once he crosses the border, he can't die either. Um, it, it, it is. It's one of those series where you're like, God, I love independent comics. God, I love creator-owned comics. Really, there's nothing better. And this this is going to be, again, I hope I'm not wrong. The next year or two, this is this will be one of the top comics out there, without question. It's that good already. I believe you. So, <laughs> um, so there's that. Okay. Radiant Black, ladies and gentlemen. So, this name, Kyle Higgins. Yep. 
I've mentioned him many times over the years and how much I love his work and how I always think he's kind of under the radar. He is one of the best writers in comics, and this book can utterly confirms that. This is the most exciting first issue of a superhero comic I've read in years. Wow. It is that good. Okay. And the art is fantastic. It's, uh, forgive me, let me look up the artist again. Mind you, he's yeah. the man who single-handedly put life back into the Power Rangers franchise, so that's, well, that, that says a lot. <laughs> Yeah, and did he not also write the Rise of Ultraman miniseries at Marvel? Recently? He did. He did indeed, yep. Yeah. I love him from his magnificent series, Cal, about the superior union politics of the 1960s, which was brilliant. He then did the science uh, crime noir, Hadrian's Wall. This guy's a great writer, and he can do a lot of different genres. I, I think this may be the, the, the culmination of, of his work thus far. Masolo Costo is the artist, by the way. Um, it's about a a young man who... I guess he's in his 20s, mm-hmm. maybe 30. He he comes back to town because he's basically screwed up his life. He tried to make it as a writer. It's not working out. He has debts, and he kind of has to come back with his tail between his legs back to his parents, his old high school buddy who's still in the town. And so the, there's the, it's a real – starts with a real meditation on someone at that kind of point in their life where – you're still young, but you, you've made so many mistakes that you're worried that you're not going to be able to correct the ship and, and like break out to what you really want to do. Many people have had this experience in their actual life, of course. And in this case, that experience runs up against, shall we say, something cosmic. <laughs> and the dialogue, the, 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 the way he captures these characters, like when you read this book, you know the main character. Maybe you are the main character. Maybe you were the main character when you were younger. Like, you know the character, and you know his friend. It's that good. And he Higgins writes a, an extensive um, commentary in the letters page about his his life and, and what compelled him to write this book. And he goes a lot into – he talks about the Power Rangers, Ian, and he also goes into, like, when he was a kid and, and how much the Power Rangers meant to him and how he was kind of picked on yep. about it. It's It's one of the most – personal like a lot of writers will do this like the first issue of a book especially if it's creator owned it's one of the most personal i've ever read and it makes you want to love and read this series all the more because you can tell he is 110 percent all in on this creation oh that that page is tremendous yeah i mean um, j- j- just looking at the artwork too i mean i, I can certainly see both. the artwork's fabulous oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no i am I didn't order two and three yet. I'll be emailing DCB service to get, the, get it back on my list because I, I just wanted to try the first one. I should have known better. I, I, <laughs> I'm slapping myself. It's Kyle Higgins, Chris. Come on. You should be ashamed. But I, I, I think this is another series that if, if, it, if it finds its traction is going to be a very important book. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you um, what. I, I'm going to add Kyle Higgins to that long list of creators that I'd love to just sit down and have a beer with and just talk like our shared – uh, experiences because if it, if Power Rangers was that much of an in- influence on him, that I need to I need to you know yeah talk you, you, you got to yeah. read his 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 uh his uh, essay at the back. Okay, yeah. great. Yep, I, <laughs> I definitely shall. Yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the world of comic books, I knew Chris would love Iron Fist. <laughs> <laughs> Wactor is the word and the way. <laughs> <laughs> so it is written. So it shall be done. I mean. Longtime friend of the show, an artist we've all admired for many years, an artist the show knew when he was just getting started, uh, essentially. And so then we go to this. Like, look oh, at that wow. splash page. Oh. Look at that. So you know, good. His, his take on basically the original Iron Fist costume. Yep. Uh, it's Larry Hammer writing, so right there you got a oh. major veteran backing up and you come off the bench for this book. Yep. Um, it's called Heart of the Dragon, immensely fun. So it takes in all the elements, like the, the classic, like fraction, like seven capital cities of heaven. All that's brought into it. Um, he's got, you know, a war named uh, Hey, and then he's like got like this diminutive, like mysterious guy named Fu, right out of like central casting from like you know pulp stuff. Um, Luke Cage is in it. Uh, he's fighting like reanimated ninjas. There's Taskmaster. I mean, that's enough. Like all I've just said, it's Larry Hammett, Dave Wachter doing Iron Fist. Uh, with all the great elements of what makes Iron Fist such a fun character, immensely, immensely satisfying. Can't wait to read more. Okay, I don't know if and I were going to read this. One. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, two moons. Yes. So that's Arcudi, 
Um, John Arcudi Wrighty, Art Alice Valerio, uh, I'm going to but just I apologize, Gian Giordano, I believe. Um, Colors by the great Dave Stewart, letters Michael Hess, uh, Heisler. So this is a Civil War uh, horror book. So that was enough for me, just, just that description. But uh, it's about an, an American Indian who is serving in the Union Army and uh, how elements of his past and of his culture start to insinuate themselves into his, his experience as a soldier uh, in that conflict. Uh, artwork is, is, I mean, here. I'll give you an example. Look at that scene. That's a skirmish. Oof. Wow. So uh, this is, artwork is beautiful. Um, like I'll get, like here's an example of how they depict some of the violence in the book. Uh, it, it's really striking artwork. And any kind of story that explores sort of like a, a character who who is sort of out of their element, either by choice or by just by circumstance, they, they're kind of thrust into a world that's not, they're not really fully accepted by or part of. I'm always interested in stories like that. And then they're bringing in a supernatural element to it. Uh, also an enormously promising first issue. So high praise for that. I can keep going if you want me to, gentlemen. <laughs> by all means, sir, by all means. Yeah. So... I finally read Priest's first volume of Vampirella. And were you disappointed, Chris? Murd, I was over the moon. (laughs) Okay. So, indeed. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Going into this, I knew three things about Vampirella. She was created in 1969, that costume, and she's an extraterrestrial vampire. That's it. I never read a Vampirella comic in my life. So... I was hopeful because what is Priest's specialty? He can take any character and make it accessible to new readers while also acknowledging and um, honoring the history. And he does that here in spades. I couldn't put this down. Um, I can't wait to uh, search out whatever the next trade comes out because for issue seven and up, it's got his trademark sense of humor. You've got the classic like, POV character who's you, like, trying to react to all this insanity. So in this case, it's a therapist. So Vampirella's in a plane crash. Everybody dies except her, of course. And the therapist thinks she's this intensely deluded plane crash survivor as she talks about her, you know, her life as Vampirella. So a lot of it's through him, like, well, that's obviously not true. There are no werewolves. You realize that, right? And, of course, the audience knows differently. So we're kind of going through it with this therapist. And... Based on some background reading I've done, there's so many references in this book to the entire history of Vampirella. There's some, there's like little notes on the bottom or certain characters. That's what Priest does. That's why his Black Panther run was so tremendous. And I think you're going to get the same thing here. I, I absolutely love this, and I could never, I could give, uh, give him fudge all about Vampirella before reading it. So that's the power of Priest once again. I, I was, I was going to say, man. I mean, like, I, it was, it was kind of, kind of expected that that you were going to love it, and I'm, I'm glad you did. Yeah, and 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 again, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, a, a froth of the mouth ac- acolyte. If he, if I didn't like what he wrote, I would just say it just wasn't my cup of tea. But mm-hmm. this again was him just firing on all cylinders. And again, what's so important with his work? There's always that humor, which kind of, which is kind of always winking the audience. Like you realize you're reading a book about like a, an alien vampire in like a red bikini ba- bathing suit, right? Like you realize you're reading this book. So we're going to have some fun with that. And I always love that kind of that subcurrent is always there in everything he does. Yeah, That so. therapist character is pretty memorable, isn't he? Oh, you you've re- you read the first six issues, Murd. I didn't know oh, that. Of course. I was the one who recommended it to you. <laughs> Murd, again, as Shane was mentioning his eyesight fading before, my memory is starting to recede as well. So I apologize profusely, brother. See, I, I nominated it for best new series of whichever year that was, 2019, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I will commit a... Symbolic seppuku later. Um, <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> I'm old you to that. <laughs> Be- before you go any further, uh, Chris, yeah. uh, speaking of memory. Uh, time to put mine to the test. So that that is easily that newfangled music. <laughs> that has easily been the best part of going video with this is that we get to see the air harp, and that's oh, that yes. just makes me super happy. Yep, it is uh, time once again for muddle the Murd. 
And uh, to explain what the heck that is, Murd has more. I'd be delighted, Ian. Yes, the Muddle of the Murd is our trivia segment here on Comic Geek Speak. Uh, it's when you, the listeners, attempt to uh, muddle me, the Murd, uh, with uh, three uh, trivia questions of a comic book nature. Uh, so if you'd like to participate, you just get together three comic book trivia questions, one Marvel question, one DC, and one about some third publisher. Uh, the questions also need to break down chronologically to one question about comics pre-1970, one about comics published between 1970 and 2000, inclusive, and uh, one about comics published after 2000. Come up with three questions meeting those parameters. Please don't make them too, too esoteric. Don't. Uh, it, it needs to be something... Uh, germane to the story or the characters, uh, no, no, no superficial detail type questions, and nothing having to do with uh, like the ads or the letters pages. J- just the stories, please. And don't forget to include the answers. Get those questions together, put them into an email, and send them to uh, comicgeekspeak at gmail.com with Muddle the Murd in the subject line. And uh, Ian, our quiz master, will gather them up. He will ask those questions to me in turn. And uh, if I fail to answer a single one of them correctly, uh, the submitter of those three questions will have Muddle the Murd, and he or she will be entitled to a prize. And we have got a nicer-than-average prize to offer our contestants right now, because we still have two of four uh, drawer boxes prize packs put up by our friends at the Collection Drawer Company late last year to celebrate their 15th anniversary. So if uh, you muddle the murd, um, well, if, if you're one of the next two people to muddle the murd, you will be received, and you live in the continental United States. We do need to throw that in there, too, because that's, that's as far as the uh, Collection Drawer folks are willing to ship. <laughs> yep. uh, you will receive a, a pack of, uh, I believe it was five uh, drawer boxes in either long box or short box size, muddler's choice, and also some uh, box sort upright dividers and some box locks anchors to stabilize the boxes uh, thrown in for good measure. Okay, great, and uh, and yes, to our to our previous winner who unfortunately uh, is uh, is lives in Canada, we just went ahead and uh, shipped out uh, a prize to you. So uh, although you do not get the drawer boxes, you do get something nice and fancy. So uh, so no worries on that. Yep, I've already communicated with him about that, and uh, Adam of Earth Thirteen is a good sport about it, and I hope you enjoy uh, what's coming your way, Adam. It's a little something uh, from the uh, vaults at the CGS studio. Excellent. Well, uh, this this contender uh, almost fell through the cracks because I, I uh, forwarded it to forwarded it to myself and kind of forgot about it. Uh, Mr. Eric Bennett uh, had a submission ah. for Muddle the Murd, uh, and uh, he had these words to say before getting to his questions, gentlemen. It's been some time since my last attempt at muddling the good Mr. Murdo, so I saw I thought this would be an excellent time to take another swing at it. I wish Adam good fortune and thank you all for your consideration. Mm-hmm. Eric. Well, Eric, uh, who sometimes goes by Thorell on the CGS forums, uh, knows his stuff when it comes to comics trivia. So I expect he's going to give me a run for my money, and uh, I'm interested to hear what his uh, third publisher question is going to be. Well, we start with that third publisher, actually, this time around. It's uh, Mm. pre-1970 Independent. Wow. Yep. He is definitely shooting for the fences on this one. Uh, In 1951's Strange Worlds number 2, Cover date September 1951, Air Force pilots Ford Robbins and Gene Dorn accidentally discover a hidden village in northern Greenland inhabited by Vikings. They aid the villagers in battle against the evil rival chieftain Singar. Name the princess of this village, who is also the main title character of this story. <laughs> Oh, my Lord. <laughs> See? What did I t- Wow. <laughs> what did I tell you? You knew what you were getting into. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, brother. Uh, what's... Mm, I'm just tr- trying to think of a good Scandinavian-sounding female name here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, they just roll right off the tongue. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Murder, uh, maybe committing symbolic, symbolic seppuku together. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well... I'm going to go with uh, Sigyn, uh, the wife of Loki from Norse mythology. You are incorrect. Uh, and I, I, thought so. I, I, I would say, hey, Chris and Shane, do you want to take a stab at it? But I don't no think idea. you will. Uh, <laughs> I, the correct answer is Dara of the Vikings. Dara of the Vikings. And so it shall be. Yep. <laughs> well, let's see how you do with Marvel 1970 to 2000 inclusive, as he makes perfectly clear. Uh, in the three-part 
uh, Val in Valhalla Saga in Defenders Volume 1, issues 66 through 68, named the main villain who sought to usurp the goddess of death, Hela, from her place in the North Norse pantheon. Ooh. Hmm. <sighs> I, I, I hope this is going to turn out to be a character I've at least heard of. I don't think I'm going to be coming up with the correct name. <sighs> okay, Defenders, 70s. Those stories can be very wacky, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yep. yes if, if, if it's part of the Gerber run, certainly. Yeah, indeed. <sighs> Blur. Yep. Malakith. That's, that's all I can come up with. Chang, Chris, any guesses? I mean, I want to say it's somebody like the Enchantresses. It's probably something with somebody more esoteric than that, though. It is indeed. Uh, the correct answer, Olaris the Unmerciful. <laughs> okay. okay, can you spell Olaris, please? <laughs> I sure can. It's O double L E R U S. Olaris. Hmm. Okay, I think I have seen that name in print, but uh, it's been some time. <laughs> Probably since that issue. <laughs> in fact, I, I'm honestly going to look it up after we're done with this muddle uh, to see if Olaris the Unmerciful has ever shown up ever again outside of that one it, that one arc because <laughs> I most certainly have not heard of Olaris before. Yep, I'd say odds are against. <laughs> uh, All right, so looking it's... at looking it up just now, the answer is yep, just that arc. No. <laughs> <laughs> And, and who was the writer on that arc? Uh, that I'll have to look up again here. Uh, I, I, I think you might be right on Gerber, to be honest. Uh, let's see. Looking up. Do, 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 do. Keep on rolling. Uh, create, created by David Kraft and Ed uh, Hannigan. Okay. Oh, hey, yep, those, yep. Are, those are some uh, known Bronze Age creator names. Yep. Yep. I don't think I knew that uh, Kraft had a run on Defenders, but there it is. Yep, that is indeed his run, and uh, Ed Hannigan was the penciler. All right, and over to DC post-2000. In Walt Simonson's seminal run on Orion, in issue number 12, in a backup with art by Jim Lee, we're introduced to a new goddess who lives in a paradise at the heart of Apocalypse— it is to this paradise that Darkseid fled following his seeming defeat in combat at the hands of Orion. What is the name of this goddess trapped at the very core of evil? Hmm. <sighs> well, I, Orion number 12. Hmm. Yep. Sounds like something I probably own, but... <laughs> Okay, uh, I have a couple of guesses in mind, neither of which is likely to be right, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, invoke the name of uh, Darkseid's lost love from his innocent younger days, uh, the Enchantress Suli. Shane, Chris, any guesses? I, I read uh, that series when it came out. I remember enjoying it, but I, I haven't read it since. It, I don't it, think I read so it. If I, I did read it, I only read the first few issues. I don't remember finishing that. Well, it is a very new god's name, Pythia. Pythia, okay. Yep. My second guess was going to be Idun, which is uh, the uh, – who in Norse mythology was the keeper of the, the golden apples and uh, kind of an Edenic figure. But yeah. and- Oh, well. <laughs> Congratulations, Eric N. You have uh, muddled the murd. Yes, indeed. And boy, oh boy, what a muddle that was. <laughs> yeah. Oof. It's rare murd can't answer any of the questions. That yeah. Was, that was a real was- smiting. Oh, yeah. well. but, yep, yep. I, I, I kind of had a feeling once we started off with uh, with pre nineteen seventy independent that things were. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought. Yeah. Wow. Does it say which which publisher did that st- that first story? I'm I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, he did not include that. Okay, I'm just uh, curious. Yep. So let's see. Strange Worlds number two. Uh, that is nineteen fifty one. Let's mm-hmm. see. There we go. Nineteen fifty one. Curious. All right. Let's see. Mind you, I had to go to eBay, and it says coverless, and then I clicked on it, and nothing was there. So let's see. Uh, <laughs> ooh. Uh, oh, wow. You know, I might, gentlemen, I might have to just share this image with you because it is, is kind of an mm. amazing image in and of itself. Okay, here we are. Uh, all right. I'm going to share the screen real quick. It's a small one, but you can still make it out. This is the cover to that comic. Ooh, oh wow! Yeah. 
It's yep. very pulpy. Yeah, yes, very pulpy. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I, I can't can't for the life of me make out the uh, the 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 name of the uh, mm. of the of the actual you know comic book house it's out of though. Huh. So I wonder if, is 1951 too early for ACG to exist? Hmm. That's a good question. Oh, it's Avon. Avon. Okay. Okay. Yep. All there right. we are. Yep. Yeah, because this, this this came from a heritage auction site, wow. and uh, they were auctioning off a very fine 8.0 of Strange Worlds number two. So <laughs> <laughs> go figure wow. on that one. Yep. <sighs> boy, oh boy. All right. Well, there we go. And uh, enjoy enjoy your uh, enjoy your long or short boxes, Eric. And uh, we will be in touch. We know that you will put them to good use. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Yep. All right, uh, Chris. Do you have any other comics you wanted to share? Uh, a few more uh, offerings from Tomorrow's actually. Um, I was reading through uh, Alter Ego One Sixty Eight, uh, which I was really excited about because it goes into the from the life of Paul Norris, who's the co-creator of Aquaman. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you mean Aquaman? Oh, I, <laughs> Aquaman. Wait. wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, there, there's your sepaku. Well yeah. done. <laughs> let, let me let me do. Uh, Aquaman. Thank you. Okay. Much better. Much better. God, I miss Ted Knight. All right. Um, so I've I've always thought, I've never read much about Paul Norris. Not I mean the stuff out there I just haven't read much myself. So I was really excited to read this. And it goes into, into when he was in World War II, he was a he served in the Pacific Theater. Um, and because of his artistic abilities, because he'd already created Aquaman by this point, he went to the service after he had done that. Um, they had him draw leaflets that they dropped by air on Japanese troops defending Okinawa. Okinawa was the last great, terrible battle of the Pacific campaign before the atomic bombs were used. And they credited his leaflets with getting some several thousand Japanese troops to surrender. They had photos of them with their hands up holding this leaflet. And he used comic images with Japanese translations to explain to them how they could surrender safely and not be harmed. Mm-hmm. And it was just a fascinating story because it's it's someone you know who was drafted who, who his superiors recognized his talents and put them to very specific and good use. And as I'm sure many people know, most Japanese soldiers would not surrender in World War II. For uh, part of it was cultural, part of it was indoctrination mm-hmm. and propaganda. And and these leaflets at least got some of these men to to willingly surrender, which was rare. So that was fascinating. There's also an essay that he wrote about his early life in here. Really interesting information. Um, I want to read more about him because I don't know much about his, like his Aquaman period. And they go into that just a little bit here, but I, I know Mort Weisinger, you know, every, everybody's, you know, sunshine boy from that time period. Um, yes, that was me being sarcastic. I've never, I've never read anything nice about Mort Weisinger by pretty much anybody who worked with him, <laughs> um, with the exception of maybe Julie Schwartz because they were friends. So, um, so I, I'm interested to learn more about that whole period, but, uh, Really interesting guy and really, really great article. I, I really enjoyed it. So there's that's Alter Ego 168. Also, there's an article in there about um, – no, no, so another World War II era story. The, the animator and artist uh, Willie Ito, who, who was in an internment camp when he oh, was a wow. kid. And he talked about you know how much he loved – before he was interned, how he loved Disney and, and, and Sunday strips and – you know, there was there was a, 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 a younger Japanese man in the camps who did like a, a camp comic strip for, for for the people there, and that kind of kept his enthusiasm going. He ended up working for for both Disney, Hanna Barbera, who was involved in the Jetsons in the '60s. Wow. So he's still alive. Really interesting article as well. And if they wanted to point out, ah, uh, Grendel. Ooh. I, I, you know, this magazine, especially for me, just never misses. So I know Shane is, is is what read a lot of back issues. Yeah. Uh, over the years as well. What's the Again, issue number in, on that one, Chris? One twenty-five. Okay. So back issue focuses on the, like the Bronze Age through, and this is called the Creator Owned Comics issue. And I haven't read the interview yet, but I can't wait. There's a lengthy interview with Matt Whit- Wagner all about Mage and Grendel. So, and to me, Matt, Matt Wagner is one of the great living masters of the medium. So I can't wait to wait to read that interview. But the article also goes into uh, Colin Duran's A Distant Soil, Stan Sakai's Usagi Yojimbo. Uh, which we, Purcell, which both of us still have to read. <laughs> exactly. Steve Purcell's Sam and Max, Dean Smith's Boris the Bear, Larry Wells' Cherry Pop-Tart. I mean, mm. this, this this magazine is always so chock full of great stuff and always well worth it. So 
that's my field report for this comic talk, gentlemen. Excellent. Excellent indeed. Uh, Merge, you got anything to share? Uh, well, I have something uh, from the Time Bubble Cargo Hall. Uh, something that I just uh, kind of on a whim uh, dug out of one of my uh, boxes of older comics. Uh, part of a lot that I bought at a local auction a long time ago, actually. Hmm. Uh, Chris, I think that you will appreciate this. Ooh. Uh, some classic Bronze Age Marvel for you. Oh, oh, give me some Richard Ryder. Give me some Richard Ryder. Wow. It's issues number one and two from 1976 of the first volume of The Man Called Nova. Wow. Oh, my God. So, yes, first and second appearances of Nova. Because it's a fitting today that I show this today because it's kind of a spiritual antecedent, I suspect, Chris, to the uh, Radiant Black series hmm. uh, by Kyle Higgins that you were touting hmm. earlier. Uh, that's a good point, Good Bert. point, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I can see that. Yep, absolutely. The origin story about a... Uh, well, it's, I mean, Richard Ryder was a bit younger when he got his powers than the protagonist of Radiant Black was, I think, since he was still in high school, still figuring things out. But it's a, a young uh, two-time loser who suddenly gets a cosmic shot in the arm and uh, finds himself rocketed towards destiny. And uh, so this is a character we've all known about and for the most part liked for a long time, but it's the first time I've actually uh, read his first couple of appearances. I have issues three and four at home, too, which mm. I have I've yet to, to read just yet. Uh, but he was created uh, or co-created by Marv Wolfman yep. as writer-editor, uh, and on art we had uh, Big John Musema and uh, Joe Sinnott. Oh. And it's uh, the origin story of how a young teenage loser Rich Ryder, it's, well, the character is—it's basically trying to catch lightning in a bottle a second time, uh, it, 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 trying to create a Spider-Man right. in the seventies. And so they began with a character which has a really cool uh, costume and visual, and a pretty cool power set—you know, cosmic energy manipulation and ballistic flight, hence human rocket. Uh, and underneath it, they just kind of to, you know, to, to undergird him. They uh, basically plagiarized Green Lantern's origin story and <laughs> Parker's <laughs> everything else. <laughs> Because, and I can't believe it take, it's taken me this many decades to realize this, but Peter Parker, Richard Ryder, yeah. Park, oh and my Ride. god, <laughs> oh my god, Murd, I, wow, you just, you just, you just broke my brain. <laughs> Well, Wolfman wasn't digging very deep here. He, he, no. he just wanted people to know very clearly what he was doing. Here's, here's your Spider Man. He's <laughs> seventy Spider Man here, folks. So yeah, we got like you're shilling peanuts at the ball game. <laughs> with, with great responsibility comes great power. Yep. Get him while he's human. Get him while he's a rocket. <laughs> All in color for a dime. <laughs> you ain't kidding. Except it was three dimes. By yeah. Now. Oh, okay. <laughs> And that was a recent price increase in 1976, apparently, yeah. because the Bullpen Bulletin's page has one of those little like, apologetic uh, messages from the editorial staff <laughs> saying, sorry, rising costs and so forth. But thank you for sticking with us. We promise to make it worth your, your hard-earned money. <laughs> Can you uh, imagine? I, I know it's 2020, and sorry for the increase from when you started reading at 25 or 30 cents. Now it's $7. <laughs> 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 sorry. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, now it's like, uh, like oh, hey, we're going to put out this Infinite Crusade. It's Seven dollars, whether you like it or not, we're not going to apologize at all. Just give us your damn money. Like, like, well, like, I hear John Candy oh, from okay. Vacation. Sorry, folks, parks <laughs> closed. <laughs> Shane, when you and I started reading GI Joe, it was sixty cents. Yeah, it sure was. Yep. Oh, see, got twenty of, bucks. Twenty bucks got me a long way then. <laughs> see, see, when, when I when I was young, yeah. ninety nine cents was cheap because I remember yeah. when they would put out those ninety. Like I think what was it? Uh, uh, Fantastic Four. Until Tales of Spider Man. Until was Tales of Spider Man yeah. was ninety nine oh, cents. Excellent. I think or Fantastic Unplugged series. I, that's what I'm thinking yep. of, Mert. Thank you. Fantastic Four Unplugged was ninety nine cents. I remember that. Yep. And it was done on older style paper. Indeed. Yes. Yep. Um, Mert reminded me of something because we were talking about the bullpen bulletins. I, I just wanted to announce that. I was really intrigued by the uh, – on our Facebook page, the discussion about the new Stan Lee biography. Mm-hmm. So I ordered a copy. Okay. And I will read it, and once I finish it, I'll talk about it on the air. But I'm really intrigued by by the premise of this book. Yeah, please do because I've heard yeah. some very mixed things about it right. uh, and whether or not it's a hit piece or not. So I, Well, that, that's what I want to discern but for yeah. myself because I read a review of it, and, and it looks like he's going into a lot of uh, – Aspects of his life that you know are controversial. Sure, the, the 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 lover of Marvel history that I've always been. I'm really intrigued by this, and I want to see, you know, where he goes. Because again, even if you just read between the lines, like the latter years of Stanley's life had a lot of disappointments and frustrations, and and, and professional, um, you know, failings and so forth. Definitely, I, I, I'm intrigued. I mean, again, this is a major figure in American popular culture, and uh, if, if it's if it's a if it's a biography that 
is critical but but fair. I'm really interested in reading that. I hope they yeah. I hope they mention Stripperella at least once. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be mentioned. <laughs> yeah, virtual guarantee. <laughs> so so what you what do you think overall of uh, of Richard Ryder's first appearance? Hmm. Uh, well, I appreciate that uh, Wolfman changed up uh, the. Uh, uh, the Peter Parker origin enough to give uh, Rich a healthy family life. And we actually had two alive parents mm-hmm. and even a younger brother who's a science nerd. So there's still that aspect of Peter Parker, but it's projected elsewhere. And he also, uh, Richard Ryder also has friends and even like a, a semi healthy relationship with a girlfriend, the girl next door, Ginger J. So, you know, Rich, Rich Ryder's got his stuff together a little bit better than Peter Parker did in the early 60s. Oh, so. God, Murd. Now that you mentioned the Richard Ryder, all I can think of is that her name is Ginger J, and Mary Jane is a ginger, and her name ends with J. <laughs> they didn't try very hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they did not. Fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Spider-Man in space. <laughs> And in the second issue, we get a couple of members of his new rogues gallery, uh, Condor and Powerhouse. Nice. So Condor being pretty similar to a vulture. You'll, you'll, you'll. <laughs> <laughs> boy, oh boy. It's, hey kids, you like Spider-Man? You like space? Is, is, Spidey, is Spidey in the first issue? Uh, actually, no. And oh, that's surprising. He, nor okay. is he in the second issue, which right. is usually when Spider-Man will make his sales boosting uh, early series cameo. Uh, but yeah, I guess they just didn't want to... They didn't want people to think too hard about the similarities that early on in the run, I guess. I, I'm, I'm proud of them uh, that, that, that that didn't happen for a while. <laughs> <laughs> has Nova been used? I know he was a big character in the Annihilation saga, but has he been used lately? Uh, he's pretty central to the uh, current volume of Guardians of the Galaxy. He is. Yeah. Okay, um, great. The Al Ewing run that I nominated in uh, this oh, year. Oh, that's right. Okay. And, and, and it is the Richard Ryder version back, right? It is, yes. Okay, all right, because because I know for a while they were they were going with a teen version, which is still around yeah. over in Champions. Uh, yeah. Oh, right, Sam Alexander, I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the teen version. Time. He was also in that Spider Man cartoon, wasn't he? Yes, Shane? he that was. was on, I uh, think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. The the ultimate Spider Man cartoon, if I remember right. correctly. Yeah, yep. Uh, Shane, you got a chance to read anything? I'm reading stuff for upcoming show. Ooh. Oh, excellent. I started that on four All right. shoes in. Very good. Splendid. <laughs> yeah. Good That's to hear. Good to hear. Um, I, I will share with the audience uh, one more thing that uh, if we do get a chance to talk to her on the show, we will. But I wanted to make sure we do mention it anyway. Um, that uh, friend of the show, Chandra Free, uh, is currently running a, uh, uh, a Kickstarter for uh, the return of her series, The God Machine. Um, and uh, that has 27 days to go uh, as of the date of this recording, and uh, we'll be putting this out tonight, so it'll have 26 days to go when you when you hopefully listen to this. Uh, but uh, she's already uh, got about 10,000 uh, to her name, and she's looking for 24,000. And basically, uh, Chandra's been a friend of the show for a while. She's she uh, oh, you yeah. know exhibited over at Super Show a couple times, and uh, and has uh, been on my show, Comic Timing, a couple times, and. Uh, has been on here on CGS at least once or twice as well, and uh, she's looking to bring back Up Machine and uh, and you know more power to her on that. Uh, plenty of good uh, backer rewards and levels here, uh, and uh, you can get a copy of the book for uh, ten bucks here from the looks of it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, fifteen bucks for the for the PDF. Ten bucks uh, is a backer credit, and fifteen bucks gets you the PDF of the entire volume. So uh, do keep that in mind, and just go ahead and search God Machine on uh, Kickstarter. And uh, it'll go ahead and uh, pop up for you. So good on Chandra for that. All right. I think that's pretty much everything I have in my pipeline. Uh, gentlemen, how about you? No, I guess the other thing I would, I would bring up, just because I just remembered it, is I also – because I, I, I also read the, um, the most recent issue of Iron Man by Cantwell and, and, and Kafu. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> it, 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 oh, I, I, I don't want to spoil too much, but y- if you love, if you love Iron Man, if you love the Iron Man history and the Rogues Gallery, and if you, if you just love when when a writer captures the essence of one of the Marvel icons, you owe it to yourself to read this series because it's that good. Mm. Um, and, it, and 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 again, the art is just. I'm talking about an artist. Born to draw the world of Iron Man. Oh yeah, um, it is, and he's doing a modern version of the classic, like Bronze Age, red and armor, red and gold armor. Nice, it's beautiful. I yeah, mean, 
and his his rogues have, have I mean they they look tr- amazing, you know like when did the when did the Blizzard ever look? I mean it really looks good. I mean and they they brought in like now Misty Knights in it and and Frogman and that sounds ridiculous but it works. Trust me, <laughs> Frogman. Um, oh, you know uh, the Scarlet Spider. Never Spiders. apologize for Frogman, Chris. I, I, I appreciate that, Murray. Scarlet they just Spiders. Just put an action figure out of Frogman. Of course they did. <laughs> yeah, uh, just just this, in the last month. Yep. Scarlet have, Spiders in there. Have they put uh, out a, an action figure for the spot yet? Because I feel like that's like the only the only oh, person that I that I need a, an action figure for. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't I don't recall a spot. Okay. Okay. All right. Polka dot man, but not spot. They, they, really? I remember the spot showing up in the uh, in the Spider Man animated series, and that was silly enough as it was. Wow. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, uh, it's yeah. it's 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 a it's a superb book. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm catching up. I, I I still haven't read past issue one, but I'm but I'm planning on it. So I'm I'm gonna tr- try to read as much as possible there. I also did pick up on a recent Comicsology sale both Undiscovered Country Volume One, and they called us Enemy. Um, so I'm looking forward to reading both of those as I've heard nothing but positive things on both of those. Uh, Undiscovered Country, uh, I know is. Uh, 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 you know, well regarded as as one of the best books of the last couple of years, um, and that's uh, Snyder and Soul working together as a team. So you can't beat that. Obviously, they called us enemy, George Decay. Enough said. Right his, about it, about it, his experience in the internment camps. Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Yep. I saw the play. It was also a stage play, right? Yes, I, I saw the play. Actually, I saw. I, I saw. That, yep. Saw it was on Broadway, and it was it was very well done. Yep. Alrighty, gents. I think that's just about it. Our bot- bolt has been shot. Indeed, indeed. And uh, stay tuned for next week uh, as uh, it is just about previews time, and we'll be shooting out our latest previews episode, nice and timely. But before we do that, we are sponsored indeed yet again by you, the listeners, over at Patreon.com/slash Comic Geek Speak. Wait, I didn't do my point earlier. You. The listeners, you <laughs> at patreon.com slash comic timing. Thank you guys. Uh, uh, patreon.com slash comic geek speak, that is, uh, for that. And patreon.com slash comic, comic, comic timing would be my thing. So go ahead and uh, be a patron if you can to both of them. But obviously, comic geek speak comes first. Patreon.com slash comic geek speak. We thank you so much for your support over there. And murder reminder on the best of. <laughs> Oh, certainly. Uh, yeah, don't forget to uh, get your ballots together to vote in the uh, Best of 2020 Awards. The address, again, is bestof at comicgeekspeak.com. Um, yeah, just don't forget to vote in 12 of the 16 categories or your ballot will be disqualified as a partial ballot. Disqualified. Oh, yep. You have until Sunday, March 21st. So vote early and uh, vote one. Vote once. Yes, yes. Not often, <laughs> because only one of them will be counted. We will be paying attention to that. Yes, so you bet I will. <laughs> yes, and, and a reminder, best of at comicgeekspeed.com. Just posting on the website uh, will not count as a vote, so make sure to do indeed send your ballots into best of at comicgeekspeed.com. And that's best of at comicgeekspeed.com. If you send it to the regular comicgeekspeak at gmail.com, it may get lost in the shuffle. So it, please do keep yes, that we'll, in mind. Yeah. We'll try to find it and forward it to the appropriate place, but we can't guarantee anything. Yes, indeed. Yep. All righty. And uh, Shane, since you are here to be Shane, let's go ahead and get <laughs> things going for the ending here. And take us home, brother. Indeed. Country roads, take us home. We are good to go. And over to you. Visit us at comicgeekspeak.com to send an email. The address is comicgeekspeak at gmail.com. To leave a voicemail, the number is 267-702-6642. Stop by thecomicforums.vanillacommunity.com and let us know what you think of all these offerings from today's episode in Price is Right fashion. Uh, Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. Thanks to everyone who contributes to the show. We appreciate it. Thank you for sponsoring us. That's greatly appreciated. It does indeed keep the lights on and the show running. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. And that's the longest that's ever gone. Here we go. (laughs) And here we go. Come on. Where are you? There we go. (laughs) 